to meet this requirement. Once a decision is effectively made by a council, that is council policy. Therefore, I'm not entirely sure what um, the, the, this particular line in that bill um, it, it, it seeks to achieve. I do worry uh, this could be open to different legal interpretation uh, and therefore challenged by bus companies leading to, I think, a risk-adverse approach by local authorities. And I hope that um, if Amendment 68 is passed, the government will consult with local authorities and local transport agencies over this particular requirement. I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will respond to, to this particular point when it sums up. Uh, however, on balance, I support Amendment 68. I believe the best way forward is to ensure that both Amendment 67 in my name uh, and Michael Matheson's Amendment 68 is agreed to, and we use Stage 3 to tidy up the final word in, in the knowledge that the principle of municipal bus services is enshrined in the bill. Now, this would mean um, also voting no to Amendment 66, uh, recognising that the first line in my Amendment 67 is exactly the same as the whole of Amendment 66 anyway, and I would urge members to vote in that way. Thank you, Colin. Uh, John Finney, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 39 and other amendments in the group, please? Um, thank you, Convener. Can I start by saying I absolutely concur with everything that um, my colleague Colin Smith said in relation to, to this. And um, this is a, an issue that uh, I'm sure all of us um, receive inquiries about, constituency inquiries, the frustrations there are about bus services. And, we, we uh, know the, the uh, regard that people have for the for uh, Lothian buses, and I accept that's an arm's length company. I have to say, I'm, uh, so I'm not going to repeat much of what um, um, Colin Smith said. Now, the public don't necessarily understand all our procedures, but as things stand, I, I, I certainly would be lending my support to, to, to Colin's amendment, and indeed the Cabinet Secretary's Amendment 68, with all the caveats that Colin's mentioned there. <coughs> Excuse me. Much of what we've heard, um, I, I hear, heard a lot of these arguments in relation to the running of our ferries, the Clyde and Hebrides ferries. Um, um, these very same arguments have been, been uh, trotted out. Mm. One argument I actually find really quite surprising, and I, I, I think local authorities would have cause to, 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 to take offence about, was the question of transparency. Who for one minute suggests that every penny of public money the local authority has isn't accounted for? That's, that really is a preposterous suggestion. I think um, this isn't an easy, this isn't an easy uh, route ahead. Um, um, the the uh, suggestion of you know, the, the um, Competition and Marketing Authority, um, state aid rules, as I said, th th there's... there's Nothing there that I haven't heard in relation to, to the Clyde and Hebrides, which is very successfully run in the public interest, exclusively in the public interest, not um, the obligation, and in the, in the, there's, there's nothing wrong with this, but the statutory obligation of any commercial organisation is to maximise profits for uh, its shareholders. That's why we get to the situation the member would. Are you saying that, in contrast to what the Cabinet Secretary has said, that uh, it is your view that um, if we do not pass 66 but go for 67 and 68, then the state aid rules is something of a red herring? Is that what you're saying? Well, um, the, the member talked earlier on about evidence. This is the first this has been mentioned in relation to this particular uh, piece of legislation. It's not that I, I, I think I've said, and you'll be aware, uh, Mr. Rumbles, that it has been said in relation to um, our ferry network. Um, I'm not concerned about that. Um, the, we, we get to the situation where um, we, we get advice on, on amendments that are put in. Um, I think Colin very uh, um, concisely said what my amendment does. It is, by its very nature, just doing something very simple, and that is lifting the ban that was previously imposed. Um, I think the public want the buses run. Um, I think we should afford our uh, local authorities the opportunity to do that. So. Uh, I will not be supporting Amendment 66. I will be um, uh, supporting Amendment 66, which I recognise will mean my own amendment won't be. But this isn't about individuals, this isn't about party. This is about giving the public the best possible means of transportation. Uh, and that's done if things are run exclusively in the public interest and not for profit. Thank you. Uh, I've now got some members who wish to speak in the debate. Uh, Richard Lau, followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, convener. People are going to claim credit for this, but some of us have been putting forward this proposal for years. 
As a councillor, I put forward that our council, uh, North Larcher, should be running buses, and other councillors have done it for years. We should have similar to what is in Lothian buses. And how did Lothian buses come about? It's because they kept their head under the parapet and didn't sell as where other people sold off their bus services. So can I personally thank the Cabinet Secretary for listening to members like me and also to other members in this committee for um, co bus companies, as far as I'm concerned, shouldn't feel under threat. But one small move has basically answered the call by many people in this country that the bus services should be for the people, should be run for the people and should accommodate the people. So bus companies don't be fearful, but basically, as far as I'm concerned, if you're not running a bus service to suit the people of this country, the council should. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, Jamie Green, followed by me. Thank you, Vino. Um, it's been a really interesting debate, actually. Uh, this is something uh, my colleagues and I have been looking at, uh, perhaps rather confusedly. It's, uh, it's a very technical piece of legislation, this whole bill, uh, this whole part on buses, uh, and, uh, and I appreciate it's, a, it's about understanding what the amendment actually does, as opposed to just the general concept. I mean, I could easily say I support the notion of, of uh, local authorities running uh, services that are, aren't just unmet need services. And I think it's actually very positive that the Cabinet Secretary has responded to um, uh, the Stage 1 report. Uh, we did talk about this a lot, and I think there was a general feeling that the idea that local authorities could only run unprofitable routes did seem a bit crazy. Um, there would be certainly no incentive for them to do so, um, and the local authorities that I've spoken to really had no interest in, in doing that. They're very happy to subsidise where it's appropriate, but the idea that they'd be re restricted in any way to run services only on un unmet need was was, was not attractive to them. I, I think what the current secretary does with Amendment 68, uh, and I'm pleased to support it, is because it does set up a framework that allows local authorities to set up a company in a due process to uh, pr participate in franchise uh, arrangements um, and indeed participate in bids and tenders like any other operator could. Uh, and I think that's an appropriate way to do it. But I do wonder if that's the only way that they can do it. And I think perhaps what, and I don't know if 67 does or doesn't do this, but I think what Colin Smith is getting at is that there may be local authorities that aren't suitably placed to go through the same onerous process as the Lothian model. Lothian model, it, it, we accept as a good one, but it's not right for every local authority. And I think there will be local authorities who do have either a couple of buses or have an arrangement to lease buses uh, from, from whichever source and would like to set up a service and run a franchise but won't have the ability to do that under uh, the proposed approach because section, Amendment 66 simply leaves out section uh, three of, uh, subsection 3 of section 28 of the bill. And I think what Colin Smith is trying to do is agree that section, subsection 3 is removed, but add in some positive language that includes uh, councils. I, I don't think this flags up anywhere to me that this, by passing 67, we'd be in a situation where local authorities would be breaching EU state aid rules or would come into the for full force of the CMA. We haven't heard any evidence to support that, I'm afraid. And unfortunately, the Cabinet Secretary didn't uh, give any substantive evidence. He claimed it would be the case. But I can't see how the wording of 67 actually would uh, make that happen. Uh, indeed, I would say, if anything, if it's not quite technically correct, well, the Cabinet Secretary has a, an excellent team of, of lawyers who can help correct that before stage three. But I'd be minded to support 67 on the premise that I think it gives local authorities that little bit of additional flexibility that they need uh, to run local services in the way that they deem fit. Um, and for that reason, I'd be happy to support either 67 or 39, whichever one was pushed. Thank you. Uh, Mike Rumbles. Mike. Thank, thanks, convener. I mean, I, I, I think this debate has been really useful. Uh, I think there's a very positive amendment that the Minister has brought forward. I also think there's a very positive amendment that Colin Smith has brought forward. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but 66, by preempting 67, what 66 does is allow local authorities to set up arm's length companies to run. And what 67 does 
is allow that to happen, but six and 68, uh, with 67 and 68 allows that to happen, but also allows local authorities to run their own bus company, uh, own bus services. So on the basis that um, I think uh, that's the right approach, and I'm just worried about state aid rules, because what the, I do understand what the minister has said, um, and that this is a stage two, uh, the Minister is able at stage three to convince the Parliament, uh, if he is convinced that this would be wrong, uh, at stage three to address that. So I'm willing to, um, because of the preemption, to vote against 66 and for 67 and 68 when the vote comes. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to wind up, please? Can you let me pick up on a couple of the points which uh, members have made? The first thing is that a uh, local authority operating a bus service doesn't do in a vacuum. Do so in a vacuum. It must be within the unregulated market, which is what we have uh, for bus services at the present moment, which is why uh, services need to operate within that space and which is why the Competition and Markets Authority say that they must operate on an arm's length basis in order to make sure that they comply with the necessary uh, competition law in these areas. Uh, alongside that, that's why there is also a need to make sure that there's a framework that makes sure that they remain on the right side of state aid rules in these matters uh, to ensure that they don't find themselves on the wrong side of state aid rules by failing uh, to make sure that they have the proper arrangements in place for operating their own services. A number of points have been made by members. First of all, for example, Colin Smith made reference to the possibility of a local authority who may have two or three buses that wants to run them on a particular route that may be profitable. They can do exactly that right now if they choose to do so, if there's an unmet need there. Uh, what the, uh, whether that be, whether it be, let me just finish this point, whether it be commercially viable or not is another matter. If it's, a, if it's one which is profitable, they can choose to do so. Um, if there is unmet uh, need there and there is no other commercial operator choosing to do so. What the amendment the government is creating is that it takes away that particular restriction which the committee asked to be removed so that if local authorities are choosing to operate bus services in competition, they do so within a framework that keeps them within the competition and markets authority rules around these matters and also state aid rules as well. I'm happy to give way to Colin Smith on this point does, again. Does Cabinet yeah. Secretary not, I mean, he was very clear there um, in his second part that, that a local authority could only run a bus directly if there was an unmet need. Now, we still have a definition of what that may mean, but my instinct is that that is a route that doesn't make any profit at all. So you not understand, though, that, that where you have a small number of buses, a, a, a local authority may run services into a rural area every two hours, for example, or, because that's all that there, there really is any possibility of actually having passengers. <laughs> and in between time, they may want to run a bus in a, a route that may actually have a small surplus. Therefore, it wouldn't meet the, the criteria for unmet need. Um, you know, for, it, it may very well be that there's a commercial company runs that bus in, in that particular route or something very similar to that particular route, but, but not all the, the particular stops. It's allowing local authorities to have that flexibility without putting that restriction on in terms of uh, unmet need. And, and simply saying you can only have that if you set up an entirely arm's length company is not the type of flexibility we, we should be trying to have. So let me just be clear here to Mr Smith then. Are you saying that if there is a commercial operator on an existing route that a local authority should be able to use those two or three buses to go into competition with them to do so? Well, presumably the is, Cabinet is Secretary it, is saying that um, an arm's length council company could go into competition with a commercial company, is, is what the, the Cabinet Secretary is saying. So I'm saying a, a, a local authority may, in a small number of cases, run a, a bus in a similar route um, to a commercial company, maybe at different times, for example. And I see that as no different at all um, from what the Cabinet Secretary is saying an arm's length company um, it will be allowed to do. So, but the point here is that, um, is that they don't operate in a vacuum. They have to operate within a competitive market. Therefore, if a local authority are utilising their resources for the provision of a bus service, to uh, commercially challenge a commercial operator, then that's when you start to arrive into issues around competition and markets authority challenges and also issues relating to state aid, the use of public money for the purposes of a commercial advantage over a commercial operator. So that's why, this, that's why the loathing model provides a model which overcomes that particular option. 
So if there's a, for example, if there was a, if there's a route within a, a local authority area just now where a local authority has two or three buses, where there's no commercial operator on it at the present time, where they choose to run that service, whether it makes a profit or not, they are perfectly free to do so because there's an unmet need there. Uh, to have access to public transport. But if there is a commercial operator on it and you allow local authority to go into direct competition with them without the proper framework in place, they could find themselves in breach of state aid rules and also on the wrong side of the CMA uh, because it's an unfair advantage that, that they have over a commercial operator by the use of public money in that way. Yeah, I'm happy to... If, if a local authority way. runs a bus um, currently where there is no commercial service and a commercial company decides they believe there's a commercial opportunity there and they run in competition <coughs> to that local authority, would that be acceptable? Uh, at present time, because of the way the law is, they would have to... Uh, no longer the legislation, would that uh, be acceptable with, under the legislation? With, with, the, with the amendment that we're putting to the bill, it will allow them to have a loathing model where they could actually do exactly that. Can, can I come back and that allows them to do that. I just seek clarity on the particular point that if a local authority runs a service directly where there's an unmet need um, and a commercial company comes along and runs a service in that area, by definition, that is no longer an unmet need and the local authority would therefore have to withdraw their service yeah. because the commercial company would have effectively determined that there was a, a, a service being provided. As the law stands at the present moment and as the committee asked for that restriction to be removed, and that's exactly what Amendment 66 does. It allows the local authority to operate on that particular route if they choose to do so. Would the cabinet secretary so, give way? So, sorry, uh, have sorry, to give, sorry. Have just uh, <coughs> I'm trying to let a free throw going here, but you've got two people going at the same time. Uh, John Fiddy was first, and, and then uh, John Mason wants to come in, cabinet secretary. So it's up to you if you want to take the intervention, but but if you want the first one would be. No, I'm more than happy to take the interventions. Thank you, Camina. I'm grateful to the cabinet secretary for taking the intervention. Excuse me, is it the Cabinet Secretary's position that amendments 67 in Colin Smith's name and 39 in my name uh, are incompetent or ultra varies? And would you also accept that um, not everyone is enthusiastic, albeit that we like the Lothian model, about arm's length organisations because they lose the direct democratic accountability? The direct running by this, uh, and we know this in various spheres of local government. I'm surprised at the nature of his question because when I've been at this committee here before, I'm sure Mr. Finney and others have been saying that council should be able to do loading, the loading model, uh, and that they should be in a position where well, they can actually set up a loading model. No, if, they, if they choose to do so, and at no point has anybody said to me that the loading model doesn't provide democratic accountability. Actually, the benefit and the reason why people are saying there should be the loathing model is because it provides that. And that's exactly what Amendment 66 provides for. Well, but with the cabinet, is it the cabinet seems to be a moving that, target here in the matter? Not at all. Is it is the cabinet <laughs> yeah, secretary's yeah. view that arm's length organisations have the same level of democratic accountability as local authority departments? Then? <coughs> uh, uh, no, they don't, uh, but they are accountable to the local authority. But I don't know if the member is suggesting that we should abolish the loathing model, well, loathing so buses model. Of course, I'm not suggesting sorry, that. sorry, yes. just, b just before this becomes uh, too. too uh, stuck in, in, in one direction. Could I try and encourage the Cabinet Secretary to bring in John Mason and then try and make a bit of headway on, on it? Because I think you've, you've answered Mr Finney as, as, as much as he's going to get an answer. Maybe you could, Cabinet Secretary, look to John Mason and then, and then make some headway. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to follow on um, Colin Smith's line of questioning, and if I'm understanding you correctly, Cabinet Secretary, but maybe you could just clarify, the legal position is quite different depending whether a local authority was actually running its own bus service or it has an arm's length company or similar which would be running it, even though that <coughs> company is owned by one or more local authorities. So that is the reason for this uh, issue, that the, the legal requirements and the legal position is quite different in these two. They are not the same. Is, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, I, I think you, you should make some headway if you, if you can. Well, you, well, enough, so the uh, member, Colin Smith, also raised the issue about uh, providing protection to the loathing bus model uh, and exemption. Uh, and the uh, uh, Scottish Government Amendment actually does that. Uh, it actually provides that exemption, so it's a, protected, uh, it's a protected arrangement as it stands at the present time, which I hope meets with Mr Finney's approval as well uh, on this particular issue. The, the other thing is that um, 
convener, it's important to recognise is that, uh, uh, going back to the point that John Mason was making, is that any local authority operating a bus service doesn't do so within a legal vacuum. There has to be a framework there in which for them to operate within the commercial sector. And that's exactly what Amendment 66 it delivers, to make sure that we comply with what would be necessary from the CMA and also to ensure that there is a contravention of state aid rules for any local authority establishing a commercial bus operation to deliver services in their area. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. So before we vote on Amendment 66, I'd like to remind members that if Amendment 66 is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 67 and 39 because of a preemption. So the question is, is that a member is, is that Amendment 66 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There is a division. Those in uh, favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Now, the results of that vote is there were five votes in favour, there were six votes against, therefore Amendment 66 is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 67 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 66. Colin Smith, to move or not move? It move. I would remind members that if Amendment 67 is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 39 because of a preemption. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 67 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. The results of that vote are the six votes in favour. There are five votes against. Therefore, Amendment 67 is agreed. We therefore will move on to the next section, which is on bus service provision of local services by community bodies. I'd like to call Amendment 230 in the name of Neil Bibby, grouped with Amendments 248, 248A and 249. Neil Bibby, could you please move Amendment 230 and speak to the other amendments in their group, please? Thank you, Convener. Good morning to you and the rest of the committee uh, and the Minister. Um, I move Amendment 230 and speak to the other amendments in the group, 248 and 249, and speak alongside Amendment 248A in the name of Jamie Green. These amendments on community transport or community empowerment and are supported not just by uh, the Labour Party but by the Scottish Cooperative Party too, which I declare I am a member of. Each seeks to bring cooperative values of community and democracy to the bill. Right now, transport legislation is weighted towards shareholders and profit extractors. The amendments in this group would give communities more of a say over bus services in their area. I will de deal with each in turn. Section 28 of the bill, as introduced, inserts a new section into the Transport Scotland Act 1985, which allows local authorities to become providers of last resort. Cooperative MSPs consider that a step forward for communities left behind by failures in the bus market. Amendment 238, however, goes further. Section 28 would be amended to give local authorities the option of also asking community transport bodies to act as a provider where local circumstances dictate and it is required to fulfil a public transport requirement. That would recognise the role community-owned operators could have in securing bus services where the market has failed. Amendment 248 requires Scottish ministers to make regulations creating a scheme that would allow for the operation of a bus route to be transferred to a community transfer body. This would be a similar process to transfers conducted under the Community Empowerment Act. We know that the bus market is changing and evolving, and it is important that bus services meet the needs of the community now and in the future. Subsection 2 allows ministers to make the necessary changes to the Community Empowerment Act to allow that to happen, and Subsection 3 sets a timescale time for such regulations to be made. These regulations will be subject to the negative procedure. The Scottish Cooperative Party believes that the operation of a bus route should serve more than the interests of the operator. Bus services should serve the interests of passengers and the wider community. I know that's a point that the committee have made consistently. One way of ensuring that bus services serve the interests of the community is to allow the community to take responsibility for a service or a route. That is the principle behind uh, the amendment. The amendment. Sure. Yep. Uh, in my area of the country, we already have community transport uh, uh, companies running 
scheduled bus services. Uh, how does this interact with that uh, clearly existing provision? Well, obviously, in some areas there are uh, community transport organisations running, but in many parts of the country uh, there are not, and this, these sets of amendments are about ensuring that, the, that there is greater rights and greater um, responsibility to promote community transport throughout um, Scotland. Um, amendment, uh, the amendment grants the Scottish Government regulation making powers to put that principle into practice. Um, amendment 248A, in the name of Jamie Green, uh, proposed instead of a requirement that ministers must make regulations for such a scheme, they may make regulations for such a scheme. That would still grant ministers, of course, regulation making powers in the primary legislation, which is the main objective of this amendment. I'd be interested in other view members' views um, on, on these amendments. Amendment 249 effectively creates a statutory duty to promote community transport. The amendment requires local authorities to have regard to the desirability of promoting community bus services and places a reporting duty on ministers, requiring them to demonstrate how they have promoted community bus services. Local transport authorities must demonstrate how they have had regard to promote community bus services in a report to the Scottish Government. Ministers would then be required to lay before Parliament a report on the impact of the operation of the Act on community bus services. That report should detail what steps ministers have taken to promote community bus services, along with a summary of information submitted to them by local authorities on how they have met their duty. Subsection 4 requires that in complying with the amendment, ministers consult certain bodies such as transport authorities, the traffic commissioner and representatives of community providers. Taken together, these amendments seek to promote community bus services and local democratic control bus services at the community level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to ask Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 248A and other amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, can I thank <clears throat> Neil Bibby for bringing this to the Committee's attention, uh, the uh, issue uh, around uh, community bus services. Uh, we have some other amendments uh, in different parts of the section of the Bill that, that also uh, seek to address that issue. I think it's, uh, first of all, uh, commendable that many communities do take it upon themselves to, to try and uh, plug gaps and, and holes where there aren't sufficient services. Um, I think on 2.30, um, if you look at what the amendment actually does, uh, it's per section 28 of the bill. At the moment, it, uh, subsection 2 says the council may provide such local services as they consider necessary in order to meet the public transport requirement, which is fair enough. And I think what Neil Bibby is inserting into that is that the community, the council may provide or ask a community transport body to provide such a service. In principle, I don't have a problem with that, uh, so I'd be happy to support that amendment. But leading on from that in 248, the, the reason I've uh, simply changed must to may is that must means that the uh, minister must do it, in essence. Um, I'd like to give the power to the minister to do it, but not necessarily mandate them to do it. And I think may infers the power on the face of the bill but doesn't make it an absolute requirement to do so. So therefore, the minister could choose to use that power if he deemed it appropriate. And I'm hoping that's maybe a compromise between the must do and the not do at all. Um, and I hope members might, might reflect on that. Uh, so I would hope that my amendment to 248 uh, would be accepted to make 248 perhaps more palatable to, to other members. Um, uh, that being said, uh, 249, um, again, I have some sympathy to, but I think I have a problem with, uh, and the reason for that really is uh, I think local transport authorities should have regard to the desirability of promoting community bus services. Um, he absolutely should, but it then goes on in quite great detail uh, in five subsections as to who they must consult with, uh, how that must uh, be, be held and, and how they must go about it. What I would say to Mr Bowie is I think there is probably some wide support from across the spectrum to uh, improve community bus services and I would suggest politely if he would consider withdrawing this amendment but working with a, a range of uh, parties and stakeholders and indeed the government if they give, uh, give a, a jet direction that they, they will want to do so to look at how we could use uh, the bus services part of the bill to uh, put a greater duty to look at improving community transport. I don't think this is the way to do it but I think it should be done so therefore I would ask that we, we certainly be willing to sit down and work with the member on 
on a, on a future amendment for stage three if you were minded to not move this one. I hope that sets out my position on this, these groupings. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Uh, Colin Smith. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I think the amendments in this group cover a range of issues relating to, to community transport, which are very important. I'm pleased to see the important role of um, community transport being brought forward, um, given its absence in the, 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 the bill itself. Um, amendment 30 would provide, a, a, I think, a welcome clarification on the potential role of community transport in providing services in instances of um, unmet needs. Uh, amendment 248 raises, I think, an interesting question about whether communities should have the ability to take over a bus route as part of a, a community asset transfer. Bus routes um, are obviously invaluable to communities, but as it stands, they often have little power over changes or cuts to them. So I welcome the opportunity to look at how we might empower communities to better protect these vital routes and run them directly if there is um, an appetite. Uh, Amendment 249 places a, a statutory duty on, on transport authorities to promote community bus services and report against that duty. Again, I think this is a welcome amendment which has the power to in, improve community transport in, in a number of, of ways. Uh, this duty, for example, would ensure that local transport authorities take adequate steps to support community transport, adapt to the introduction of an LEZ, and it's an issue of the potential burden of an LEZ on community transport is one that, that this committee has already heard from uh, at stage one and indeed uh, during stage two. All too often, community transport can be forgotten despite the invaluable role it plays, and I think this amendment will ensure that it is properly supported without being prescriptive about what that entails, and I hope members will support um, amendments 230, 248 and 249 in Neil Bibby's name. Thank you, Colin. Uh, John Finney, then followed by the Cabinet Secretary. Just very briefly to say that I'm uh, very supportive of Mr Bibby's uh, um, amendments and the important role that community transport can play. Thank you. Thank you. John, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Commissioner, can I first of all say that the Scottish Government recognises the important role that community transport services have in allowing people to play a greater part in their local community, helping them to be independent, have a more active lifestyle and have less resilience on reliance on uh, social and health services. I want to build on what exists now, but I don't believe amendments in this group uh, would help with this. Amendment 230 and 248 are linked, so I'll address them together. And in my view, these amendments are neither workable or necessary. It is not necessary for Scottish ministers to provide a scheme for a community group to make a request to operate a bus route, as Amendment 248 seeks to provide. There is, in fact, nothing to stop a community group applying for a PSV licence or a community bus permit if they consider it appropriate to operate a bus route. The amendment would not take away the need for a body wishing to provide a service to comply with the usual PSV licensing and bus registration legislation. The intention of Amendment 230 and 248 taken together seems to be to enable a local authority to transfer an asset in the form of a bus route to a community body. To be clear, the new ability of a local authority to provide bus services as an unmet passenger transport requirement that is contained in the proposed new section 71A of the Transport Act 1985, which is being inserted by section 20 of the bill, is not an exclusive right, nor an asset capable of being transferred under a scheme as proposed. Additionally, another commercial operator may subsequently decide to start operating the route and it would no longer be an unmet need which the local authority have powers to provide. If a local authority were to seek, uh, were seek, were be, uh, were to, uh, seek a third party, such as a community body, to provide an unmet passenger transport requirement, the appropriate thing to do would be to, to offer it out as a supported service under the existing powers in section 63 of the Transport Act 1985, following the appropriate procurement route. To do anything else more favourable for a community body, which would be an operator like any other and could, of course, tender to provide the service, could breach procurement rules. Turning to Amendment 248A, this would alter Amendment 248 so that it is not a duty on the Scottish Ministers to make such a scheme, but a power that they may use. Well, so I appreciate what Jamie Green is trying to do here. As I've set out, making such a scheme is not workable, appropriate or necessary, and as such, I can't support Amendment 248A. 
Amendment 249 would place a number of bureaucratic burdens on LTAs and the Scottish Government, and these would not add value to the operation of community bus services. The proposed amendment would require LTAs to consider promoting community bus services in carrying out their duties in relation to Part 2 of the Bill, those being bus service improvement partnerships, local services franchising, local authority provision of services and data provision. It is very hard to see how this could be appropriate within those functions. The promotion of one bus service or category of service over others has the potential to distort the commercial market, which could negatively impact on other services and raise anti-competition anti concerns. Additionally, there are already pillars in Section 63 of the Transport Act 1985 to allow local authorities to take some measures to promote the availability of public passenger transport services, and this can include community bus services where an authority considers appropriate. The amendment also seeks to make the Scottish Ministers consider and report on LTA's actions in relation to promoting community bus services. As I have said, to impose the proposed duty on local authorities is not appropriate, and it would also not be appropriate or necessary for Scottish Ministers to carry out this reporting function. All of this is not to say that I do not think that we can make progress in this area. I do expect community transport provision to be a factor in any consideration LTAs are making in respect of franchising, local authority run bus services and bus service improvement partnership proposals. And this will be reflected in guidance on these elements in due course. We will, of course, be engaging with LTAs as we implement the bill measures, and I will ensure that the promotion of the benefits of community transport are included in these engagements. I therefore ask Neil Bibby not to move Amendment 230 or press Amendment 248 or 249, but if he does, I would ask the committee to reject him. And I would also ask Jamie Green not to move Amendment 248A, but if he does, I would therefore ask the committee to reject the amendment. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And Neil Bibby, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Um, thank you, Convener. Thank, uh, thank members for their support and principle for amendments and, and uh, the constructive comments that have been received. Um, the, as I said earlier, the amendments in this group deal with various aspects of community transport and community bus services, but each is very different in its purpose. Uh, the bill makes clear that there is a role for local authorities as a provider of last resort. That does not change with Amendment 230. Amendment 230 it simply allows a local authority to ask a community bus operator to assume the role of provider of last resort. Both local authorities and community operators are locally accountable. Both exist to provide public services not to accumulate private profit. Asking a community operator to become a provider of last resort simply expands the powers available to councils, but also recognises that in some parts of the world, a community provider may offer the best solution to market failure and the contraction of the bus network. Will the member take an intervention? Yes, take an intervention. Yep. Uh, can he point me at the rule that prevents a local authority from currently asking a community transport body to do what he's uh, suggesting? There's obviously... the. The bus market is evolving and changing, um, and will evolve and change as a result of this bill. So, in actual fact, there might be changes as a result of this bill that will make um, make that more more difficult. Um, as I indicated earlier, amendment two. Yeah, it, there are no provisions in the bill that make that this bill that make that more difficult at all. So, it's incorrect to state that that's the case with the introduction of this bill. Um, well, we need to. I, I, want, I want to ensure that this amendment is on the bill to ensure that c community transport could be used as a, an operator of last resort, and I, and I, I don't see um, if, if that is, if, that why that is a, that, that's a problem. Um, as I indicated earlier, Amendment 248, uh, 248 is based on the principle that bus services are community services, and the operation of those services should be transferable to a community transfer body. The principle is sound. In other areas of policy, a procedure for community asset transfer has been established. I'm proposing that we apply a similar logic and similar procedure to public transport and the operation of local bus services. This amendment would grant the Scottish Government the power to translate that power policy into practice through regulation. Um, in the interest of um, consensus and building cross-party support for developing 
uh, this cross uh, cooperative agenda. Um, uh, I'd be happy to uh, I wouldn't object to Amendment 248 on transferring bus routes uh, to the community. Uh, and I am um, happy to uh, withdraw Amendment 249 on creating new duties to promote community transport to work with other parties on how best we can do that. But it's absolutely vital that we do promote community transport, and that is on the bill. And I'll seek to bring that back at um, stage three. So, um, uh, yeah, so I'll move Amendment 230 in my name. Thank well, you. Uh, thank you. Well, we'll come to that in due course. Eh? Thank you. Um, <coughs> As this man has been quest, uh, pressed, the question is that Amendment 230 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There is division. I therefore, those in favour, please raise your hands. Those against, please raise your hands. There are five four votes for this amendment, six votes against, therefore uh, Amendment 230 is not agreed. The question is that Section 28 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. <clears throat> yes. I therefore call Amendment 68 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 66. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 68 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, I'm now going to move on to the next section, and I notice that... Uh, I mean, we are some two hours into uh, this committee meeting, so what I'd like to do is finish this section and then we'll take a short break. Um, so uh, members will bear that in mind when they press or, or their, their amendments. So we're on bus service improvement partnership, the contents of a partnership plan. And I'm going to call an amendment 69 in the name of Colin Smith, group with amendments 70, 71 and 72. Colin Smith, to move amendment 69, and to speak to amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I'm happy to move Amendment 69 um, and to speak on Amendment 69, 70 and 72, which add at various points in the Bill's provisions on bus service improvement partnerships the need to consult with and take account of those living in poverty and those with relevant protected characteristics. It's important that these partnerships deliver for all passengers, and these amendments will ensure that inclusion is at the very heart of the plans. The provisions around consultation in particular will ensure that voices which are far too often overlooked are included. Transport is an important role to play in the lives of those living in poverty or with protected characteristics. It can provide essential access to a range of opportunities and services. Equally, poor or inaccessible public transport can both contribute towards poverty and worsen its effects. These amendments will ensure that this is kept in mind as these plans are developed. This could inform a range of aspects of these plans. The most obvious example is the affordability of fares, but equally it should inform a range of other decisions. For example, it may impact on decisions around routes by ensuring that services are run to deprived areas. Ensuring that, that BSIPs work for those living in poverty and those with protected characteristics is, in my view, fundamental to their success. These amendments help achieve this. Last week, the Government's own Poverty and Inequality Commission said that deeds and not words are required from the Scottish Government to deliver an economy that helps tackle poverty. The Government may argue that the Fair of Scotland duty puts tackling inequality at the heart of key decision-making, but it's worth bearing in mind that the, the, the Fair of Scotland duty um, doesn't cover currently regional <coughs> transport agencies, and therefore uh, uh, you know, it's unlikely to deliver what I'm aiming to do in, in these amendments. Um, amendment 71 just clarifies that efforts to obtain views on BSIPs shouldn't be exclusively limited to current passengers. We have a current uh, a significant challenge with patronage on bus services, and reversing these trends means engaging with those who aren't currently, for whatever reason, using buses but could potentially be future passengers. It could ensure that those who do not use buses due to specific barriers, be it accessibility, cost, and so on, have an opportunity to feed into the process and highlight these particular issues. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Colin, I therefore only one member so far has indicated who wish to speak. Jamie Green. Uh, just to say to Mr Smith, I would be pleased to support Amendment 71. Thank you. Uh, no other member has indicated they wish to speak. Cabinet Secretary. Paul Smith's Amendment 69 to 72 in this group uh, and Amendment 83 to 94 in the group on the consultation on making variations and uh, revocation of partnership proposals seeks to impose additional requirements as to the content notification of and consultation on bus service improvement partnership plans and schemes. Uh, this issue uh, raised, uh, raised, it was raised by uh, uh, these amendments are 
uh, all of these amendments are similar. These amendments have a specific focus on ensuring that account is taken of the need and views of those on low incomes or who have experience of poverty and who find it difficult to use or afford local services because they have, to, they have a protected characteristic listed in the Equalities Act 2010. I absolutely agree with Colin Smith that these are important considerations, but I do not think these amendments, as written, would have the desired effect. The amendments, firstly, require bus service improvement partnership plans to describe how schemes under them are intended to meet objectives regarding the quality and effectiveness of local services in meeting the needs of such persons. Secondly, these amendments would require plans to describe proposals for obtaining the views of such persons as to how, we, how well uh, plans and schemes are working. As far as plans objectives are concerned, the bill as introduced just gives scope to LTAs to set the objectives to be met by bus service improvement partnership schemes as regards to the quality and effectiveness of services and significant flexibility is set uh, in order to allow service standards to be set and to meet those objectives. These objectives and the associated standards may include objectives and standards specifically aimed at meeting the needs of those in low incomes or whose ability to use local services affected by their having a protected characteristic. Indeed, I would expect that to be a key consideration for any LTA embarking on a bus service improvement partnership. So from the, that point of view, Amendment 70 is unnecessary. For a similar reason, I consider Amendment 69, which requires specific analysis of how existing local services are meeting the needs of those in the plan area on low incomes, is also unnecessary. New Section 3A2BI would already allow for such analysis, which would be fundamental to determining what measures a bus service improvement partnership proposal should take forward to improve bus services. But I also have a concern that placing LTAs under such a stark duty on this particular matter may, in practice, narrow their focus. Bus service improvement partnerships are collaborative partnerships which will have analysed uh, the existing service provision in the area and the policies to be implemented in order to make substantive improvements. Scheme objectives may be wide-ranging, from making local services accessible to all those on low income to reducing congestion or air pollution. If low incomes or poverty were issues affecting the decline in bus services, then this should have been identified in the scoping analysis. While affordability and accessibility are likely to be key objectives in such cases, there is, is a risk that these amendments could cause LTAs to focus on fares and pricing to the exclusion of wider quality and accessibility measures, even in cases where low income or poverty were not driving the decline in bus use. This could hamper the effectiveness of bus service improvement partnerships or decrease the appetite for LTAs to promote them. For those reasons, while Mr Smith's amendments are laudable, I would urge him to withdraw Amendment 69 and not to move Amendment 70. The consultation and notice requirements included in the Bill, as introduced, are also extensive. They require general notice of partnership proposals and of proposals to vary plans and schemes in force in such manner as the LTAs consider appropriate in order to bring them to the notice of persons in their area as well as specific requirements to consult organisations representing the users of local services. Bus service improvement partnership plans themselves must contain details on how the LTA intends to obtain the views of users of local services as to how well the plan and any scheme under it are operating. All of this is considered sufficient to ensure that adequate notice is given to and consultation is undertaken with anybody, including those affected by poverty, who may be impacted by bus service improvement partnership plans and schemes. Importantly, the approach taken by the Bill as introduced imposes these requirements in a way which is clearer and practically achievable. Amendment 71 and 72 would make matters less clear and indeed in some instances may impose duties which are practically unachievable. In particular, Amendment 72 
would appear to require LTAs to give notice to or to consult all persons who have experience of poverty in respect of bus service improvement partnerships, future operations. Poverty in this context is not defined and would be very challenging to define. But even if such a definition were possible, it would simply be impossible to identify, consult and give notice to every person who has that experience. An inability to meet the requirement imposed by these amendments may frustrate the process of partnership proposals. Finally, I would add that the consultation on bus services preceding the bill uh, made clear that quality uh, partnership and quality contract schemes were not used because they were considered too onerous. I do not want to repeat that error with bus service improvement partnerships. So while I have sympathy with Mr Smith's aims, I do consider his intentions to be laudable and I would urge him uh, uh, not to press amendment 69 to 72, but if these amendments are pressed, for the committee to reject them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Colin Smith, uh, could you wind up, please? Thank, thank you very much, Convener. I'll just briefly remind the Cabinet Secretary that last week the Government's own Poverty and Inequality Commission said deeds and not words are required from this Government to deliver an economy that helps tackle poverty. And, and frankly, simply saying this may happen is words and it's certainly not deeds um, from the Government. There's absolutely nothing within this bill that will ensure um, we look at the issue around affordability and, and people living in poverty um, being able to access um, uh, bus services um, uh, and to try and tackle the barriers that are in the way for people to, to achieve that. Um, I have to say that to imply that you cannot consult people living in poverty um, or, or those uh, with other particular characteristics because you're not able to consult every single one of them, frankly, that's not what the amendment is saying. The <coughs> amendment is saying that we should efforts should be made to consult people in those circumstances and develop these plans and consider as part of these plans, only one of the factors, but consider as part of these plans how we break down those barriers for people on, for example, low income or people living in deprived communities often which do not have uh, bus services, how we can use BSIPs to try to tackle these particular uh, issues. And it's disappointing that, that, that today the Cabinet Secretary didn't bring forward any alternative as to how that may be achieved um, going forward. Um, uh, so on that basis, then, um, I, I, will, I will move um, with my amendments in due time. Thank you, Colin. The question is that Amendment 69 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No, no. We're not agreed. There's division. Those in favour, please raise your hands. Those against, please raise your hands. There are two votes in favour. There are nine votes against. Those, therefore, Amendment 69 is not agreed. I call Amendment 70 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 69. Colin Smith to move or not move? Yeah, move. The question is that Amendment 70 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed. Therefore, there's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes in favour. There are nine votes against. Therefore, Amendment 70 is not agreed. Can I call Amendment 71 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 69? Colin Smith to move or not okay. move? Move, convener. The question, therefore, is Amendment 71 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's, there is division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes in favour, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 71 is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 72 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 69. Colin Smith to move or not move? Okay, move. The question is, Amendment 72 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed, there's a division. Uh, those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes in favour, there are nine votes against, therefore Amendment 72 is not agreed. Now, I had hoped to move on to the next section, but I'm not going to, uh, because there was quite a lot of uh, speaking done in that. Uh, I won't point the finger at anyone, but one particular member spoke for seven minutes and 36 seconds, which is quite a, a long period of time uh, to speak for in this amendment. So I'm now going to, to suspend the meeting uh, for eight minutes to allow members uh, to get a cup of coffee or whatever. Thank you. The meeting suspended.
I, I'm going to reconvene the meeting and we're on bus service improvement partnership facilities and measures. I'd like to call amendment 73 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary group with amendments as shown in the groupings. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, please could you move amendment 73 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, convener, Secretary. following engagement with stakeholders, I have identified the need to add to our provision on the circumstances that surround the making of traffic regulation orders made under the bill. Where the provision of a facility is a bus service improvement partnership uh, requires a traffic regulation order for a road for which the Scottish Ministers and the traf are the traffic authority, uh, the scheme can only go ahead if it is agreed by the local transport authority and Scottish Ministers acting jointly. These amendments put in place the same arrangements for cases where a measure in a BSIP uh, requires the traffic regulation order making Scottish Ministers and the local transport authority joint partners in the scheme. The distinction between facilities and measures can broadly be described as infrastructure and other. Given the broad nature of the concept of measures, I am seeking to ensure that a scenario where they require a traffic regulation order in such circumstances is created for in the Bill to provide parity with the concept of facilities. Amendment 73 gives effect to this by inserting the taking of measures to Section 3 E1 of the Transport Scotland Act 2001. Amendments 77, 78, 170, 171 are further consequential amendments to ensure that measures are included alongside facilities in the circumstances that I have set out. The Scottish Government has listened to the recommendations made by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in their Stage 1 report. Accordingly, I have brought forward Amendment 179 to ensure that any regulations made by Ministers about what may constitute a facility or measure will attract affirmative procedure. I move Amendment 73. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. No members indicated they wish to speak. Um, I'm assuming Cabinet Secretary don't want to say any more. Cabinet Secretary? No. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that the Amendment 73 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, we move on to the next section, which is Bus Service Improvement Partnership traffic regulation orders. Can I call Amendment 74 <clears throat> in the name of the Cabinet Secretary group with amendment as shown on the groupings? Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move Amendment 74 and speak to the other amendments in the group? Cabinet Secretary. Convener, Amendment uh, 73 in the grouping Bus Service Improvement Partnership Facilities and Measures put in place arrangements for cases where a measure in a Bus Service Improvement Partnership requires a traffic regulation order on a road for which the Scottish Ministers are the traffic authority, making the Scottish Ministers and the trans local transport authority joint parties to the scheme. This group of amendments are consequential upon the policy intention behind Amendment 73 and others in that group. Amendment 74 provides a definition so as to be clear as to what constitutes a traffic authority by reference to section 121A of the Road Traffic Regulation Act 1984. Amendment 75 amends section 3E2 of the Transport Scotland Act 2001 uh, to confirm that bus service improvement partnership schemes in these circumstances may only be made, postponed, varied or revoked by local transport authorities and Scottish ministers jointly. Amendment 76 is a consequential amendment to ensure the measures are included alongside facilities in the circumstances that I have set out. Amendment 175 and 177 seek to relax the definition of TRO uh, for the purposes of a, BI, a BSIP provision. Uh, currently, the definition in the uh, 2001 Act restricts the making of a TRO to a purpose relating to the regulation of the use of the road by public service vehicles, uh, namely buses. This is potentially too restrictive an approach, given that TROs may be required to enable measures to be taken in relation to car parking, for example. As such, uh, the definition is being relaxed and uh, being allowed to default back to its natural meaning so that LTAs have a broader suite of options available to them. And I move Amendment 74 in my name and ask members to support the other amendments in this group. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no other members asked to speak. I assume, Cabinet Secretary, you don't want to say anything more. Thank you. The question, therefore, is Amendment 74 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. 
We are agreed. I therefore call amendments 75, 76, 77 and 78, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Can I invite Cabinet Secretary to you, you to move amendments 75 to 78 on block? Moved. Can I ask if any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 75 to 78? No. Okay, therefore the question is that amendments 75 to 78 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I move on to the next section, which is Bus Service Improvement Partnerships, Regulation on Partnership Time. I'd like to call Amendment 281 in the name of Jamie Green Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Jamie Green, please, could you move Amendment 281 and speak to all the amendments in the group? Jamie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I move Amendment 281? Uh, these, this grouping of amendments are around the Bus Service Improvement Partnerships, uh, commonly known as BSIPs and uh, the, specifically around the regulations on partnership timings. Um, as it stands at the moment, looking at the bill, Section uh, 3F, Effect of Partnership Plans and Schemes, states that a local authority must provide a facility or take a measure that forms part of a BSIP no later than the date specified in the scheme. Uh, however, Section 3G, under postponement of partnership schemes coming into operation, uh, seems somewhat to roll back that commitment by stating that if a local authority may, if they consider it appropriate, decide to postpone the coming into operation of a partnership scheme or any part of it, uh, uh, that this should be no greater than uh, 12 months. But the reality is, though, that postponing a bus priority measure, um, in effect, would also uh, postpone the operator's ability to uh, generate uh, passenger growth and income, uh, whilst expecting uh, operators to meet the additional service standards uh, uh, that would increase uh, perhaps their operating uh, costs as well. Now, the amendments uh, in this group, uh, 281, uh, 282, uh, specifically seek to address the uh, and cap the length of postponement and the number of times a postponement can take place. Amendments 79A and 80 a are amendments to the Cabinet Secretaries. Uh, 79A uh, would uh, additionally uh, insert uh, a, a limit on a postponement to no more than 24 months, uh, if uh, deemed appropriate by Ministers 80A does the same to Amendment 80. Um, on Amendment 79, 80 and 178, I think these amendments that are being proposed would result in ministers having the power to postpone the implementation of a partnership scheme potentially for over a year and could hinder the timely implementation of such a scheme at the behest of ministers. Granting this power, I think, is unnecessary, as local authorities should be able to implement the scheme at a time that they see fit, um, as the current provisions in the bill will provide a good enough framework uh, for local authorities. So I wouldn't be minded not to support 79 and 80 for those uh, reasons. Uh, these amendments and some of the others that I'll come on to uh, later uh, were drafted in consultation uh, with the uh, Confederation of Passenger Transport, who I'd like to thank for their involvement and input in this. Um, and these amendments reflect uh, somewhat their views and perhaps the views of many operators who work uh, in the industry. Thank you, Jeremy. I call Cabinet Secretary to speak to the Amendment 79 and other amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Amendment 79, 80 and 187 are designed to allow Scottish Ministers by regulation to amend the maximum period of postponement for a planned bus service improvement partnership scheme or any variation of such a scheme. Given the nature of these pillars, I believe it's appropriate that they are subject to the affirmative procedure. We have put them uh, forward as it seems important that some flexibility is built into this part of the process in order that reasonable adjustments can be made over time in response to experience of schemes in operation or shifting market dynamics. It may be that longer or shorter time periods are more appropriate in order to minimise the impact of any postponement on the parties to such an agreement. We will, know, it will only know uh, that, however, uh, through watching and learning the operation of schemes. A postponement is not an action to be taken by the LTA lightly. The collaborative nature of the preparation of the plan and the scheme should highlight any potential difficulties in this regard, and these should be accommodated accordingly. 
Any postponement will be for genu genuinely unforeseen and unavoidable reasons. It would delay a scheme, uh, uh, the scheme that has taken time and effort of parties involved to put in place. And as such, it is not anticipated that postponement is an action that LTAs would use lightly or repeatedly. We cannot, however, foresee all of the eventualities and have sought in all the bus service improvement partnership provisions to strike the balance between the clear process and flexibility. Jimmy Green's amendment 79A and 80A would set the maximum period for the postponement of a planned bus service improvement partnership or any variation of a bus service improvement partnership at 24 months. Mr Green's amendments at 281 and 282 would put in place the additional condition that a bus service improvement partnership or variation of such a partnership may be postponed only once. Whilst I agree that postponement of a bus service improvement partnership would create considerable uncertainty to the parties uh, to that agreement, I would wish to avoid such an overtly restrictive approach to this process. Restrictions of this type could ultimately be problematic for the LTA and may uh, find themselves in a situation where they must bring into operation a scheme which does not yet have all of the standards, facilities or measures in place. I would wish to avoid a procedural difficulty of this nature where possible. It is for these reasons that I propose that elements of the element of flexibility uh, can be taken forward through a regulation-making power which is provided, subject to the appropriate safeguard of affirmative parliamentary process in relation to time periods for postponement. The level of specificity of Jamie Green's amendment seeks to impose a potentially restrictive uh, regime, uh, which I don't believe is appropriate in these circumstances. I would therefore uh, ask uh, Jamie Green uh, not to uh, press his amendments, but I would ask uh, them to support amendments uh, 79, 80 and 178 in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. No other members indicated they wish to speak. Therefore, Jamie Green, could I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Uh, thank, thank you. I've, I've listened carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary is saying. Um, based on uh, his comments uh, around uh, Amendments 281 and 282, I think he makes a, a valid point. I, I wouldn't want an unintended consequence would be, would be that a scheme would have to be implemented if it were not uh, ready to do so. And I, I, I totally take that on board. So on, on that basis, I would withdraw those two amendments. However, on 79 and 80, I would still like, like to make the point that as it's drafted at the moment, the Minister's Amendment says that the Minister may, by regulation, specify a different total period of postponement than the one being specified. But it could be... Uh, 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 there's, there's no limit to how long that could be. And I think a 24-month postponement is a reasonable amount of time uh, to put a limitation on that postponement. As it's currently drafted, it could be years, it could be decades. Um, and I don't think that's fair on either the LTA or the operators involved in the partnership. As you say, it's a collaborative approach. I'd be happy to. As I stated, any time limit on it will be through affirmative procedure. So it will, have to, it will require parliamentary approval. It just, says, it's just to respond to that, it says that made by regulations amend subsection 5 to specify a different total period of postponement time. Yeah. That would therefore set the maximum postponement as part of that regulation? So, as I stated, uh, these are by regulation, and they're regulation which is by affirmative procedure, which means that they would have to come before Parliament for approval. So any time limit has actually got to be agreed by Parliament. Uh, thank you for uh, confirming that. That provides me with some comfort there, thereof. Uh, no further comments. OK. So uh, you, I understand uh, that Jamie Green wishes to withdraw Amendment 281. Is that right? 281. 281, yeah. Indeed. So does any member object? No. Therefore, the amendment is withdrawn. I therefore call Amendment 79 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 281. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. Call Amendment 79A in the name of G Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 281. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move, convener. Right. Uh, Cap... Yeah. The, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 79 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 282 in the name of Jamie Green. Already debated with Amendment 281. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move. 
the question, therefore, I'm uh, sorry, the, I therefore call Amendment 80 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 281. Cabinet Secretary to move formally, please. Moved. The question, uh, sorry, I call Amendment 80A in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 281. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. I've, the question, therefore, is Amendment 80 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, I'm now going to move on to bus service improvement partnerships, reports on partnership schemes. I'm going to call Amendment 231 in the name of Jamie Green in a group on its own. Jamie Green to move and speak to Amendment 231. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Amendment 231 is around the reporting on partnership uh, schemes. Section uh, 3J of the Bill uh, details the requirements of the local authority to report on the effectiveness of a partnership scheme every 12 months. Um, experience today from uh, st the current statutory quality partnerships, uh, the predecessor model to BSIP, um, have demonstrated that in reality, when it comes to reporting, local authorities have not always delivered uh, timely or comprehensive data. Uh, I think this undermines the ability of the partnership itself to make informed decisions on its future direction. Therefore, I've added in uh, some further requirements uh, under the reporting uh, requirements uh, for additional information to be specified in its reporting. I think the bill should be amended to include a requirement that annual reporting on effectiveness includes up-to-date and relevant data relating to uh, relevant service standards and the BSIP's aims, including uh, peak and off-peak bus, uh, average bus speeds, and for those figures to become the basis for further local authority action should there be no improvements to services. Uh, I would be keen to hear what the Cabinet Secretary and indeed any other members have on these additional reporting requirements and if they felt they would be useful or form useful parts of a, a BSIP and how it is different from a statutory quality partnership. Thank you, Jamie. Um, no other members wish, indicated they wish to speak. Cabinet Secretary, please. Convener, Jamie Green's Amendment 231 seeks to impose additional requirements as to the content that the annual report to be prepared by a local transport authority on bus service improvement partnership schemes must contain. The bill as it stands sets out the requirement that the LTA must prepare and publish an annual report on the effectiveness on a BSIP scheme and who is to be consulted during the preparation. It also specifies that the LTA must consider representations made to them about the effectiveness of that scheme. The reporting requirement relates to the overall effectiveness of the scheme. I consider this to be adequately broad so as to encompass the first aspect of the proposed amendment on the achievements of the scheme objectives on quality, effectiveness and service standards. In relation to bus speed, I'd like to be clear that I think this is likely to uh, be exactly the sort of metric uh, that will uh, be used by many partnerships when they are considering uh, this issue of establishing a partnership, given the importance that tackling congestion to making bus services more attractive to passengers uh, can play. However, I do not consider it necessary to uh, prescribe a reporting duty in relation to any specific indicators over any other in primary legislation. Each scheme will be unique, and we would wish to avoid the scenario where reports are published on bus speeds, where addressing those speeds is not a scheme objective. Where bus speeds are a key indicator, the scheme is aiming to tackle this, of course, uh, should be addressed in the report. I would uh, add that we intend to set out in guidance further details as to what the reports should contain, and my officials will be working with bus operators, local transport authorities and other stakeholders on that. There is also a regulation-making power in Section 3L. Should that be considered a useful and proportionate course of action, to take at a future date. Therefore, whilst I very much uh, understand what Jimmy Green is seeking to achieve here, I would urge him not to press Amendment 231, uh, uh, and if it is pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Jamie Green to wind up, please. Thank you. I, I mean, I hear what the Cabinet Secretary is saying. He's, he's saying that the, this data is important and, and, and these things should be monitored, but doesn't seem keen to actually make it a requirement to measure or report on them, which uh, seems strange. At the moment, as it's currently worded, the bill, it's on page 17, uh, if anyone's looking at it, um, line 37, 
Uh, the, the, the scheme uh, uh, must uh, publish and report on the effectiveness of the scheme, and that's about as much detail as it gives. It doesn't really uh, go in, into any great deal. My amendment, I think, provides some helpful uh, additional uh, reg recommendations. The Minister says they will be in the guidelines. We haven't seen those guidelines. Uh, if the Minister was willing to share them with the uh, committee, perhaps ahead of stage three, we can see whether they are suitable. Um, but it, I, all I'm simply asking for is that the data is provided. Now, what they do with that data is another matter. Um, but I think it would be useful data to have, uh, given the importance of Im uh, improving uh, average bus, bus speeds to improve modal shift to buses. It also then, importantly, I think, in subsection C says, where the progress towards achieving the objectives and service standards is not satisfa satisfactory on the steps that the local authority intends to take. And that really, uh, I think, then means that it's not just reporting numbers for numbers' sake, but actually setting out a plan as to how uh, the schemes will be improved. So I don't see this as being particularly an onerous task on, on the partnerships. I see it as being uh, a useful collection of important data, and I would hope uh, members would agree with me that, um, that we, this should be uh, in included. Uh, so I would be minded to continue to move Amendment 231 on that basis. Thank you. Uh, the question, therefore, is Amendment 231 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes in favour. There's seven votes against. Therefore, Amendment 231 is not agreed. We would then move on to section, the next section, Bus Service Improvement Partnerships, provision of information by operators. I'd like to call Amendment 81 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary, can you please move Amendment 81 and speak to the amendments in the group? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener, this uh, committee stage one report recommended that the Scottish Government considered whether the service data provisions contained in the bill might provide sufficient information to enable a local transport authority to fully evaluate the pros and cons of using the powers available in part two of the bill. Amendment 81 and 98 seek to address this issue by inserting new section 3JA and 13QA of the Transport Scotland Act 2001 to provide powers for a local transport authority to gather information from bus operators when considering and implementing local service franchises and bus service improvement partnerships. Amendment 174 amends section 39 of that Act to enable the Traffic Commissioner to impose a penalty on an operator who fails to comply with a requirement to provide information under those new sections. I would make clear that the information that uh, can be required under these provisions can only be used for the purposes it has been obtained, and the new provisions create offences in respect of any breach of the conditions of use and disclosure by an LTA or a person acting on its behalf. Officials carried out discussions with stakeholders, including the Confederation of Passengers and the Association of Transport Convening Officers, in developing these amendments and will continue to do so as regulations and guidance are developed. I am grateful to Colin Smith for the amendment he has brought forward in this group. However, I consider that the Scottish Government amendments put forward addressed information requirements fully. As such, Amendment 82 and 102, in my view, are unnecessary. I therefore ask Colin Smith not to press Amendment 82 and 102, but if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them, and I would ask the committee to support Amendment 81, 98 and 174 in my name, and I move Amendment 81. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Colin Smith, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 82 and any other amendments in the group? You need to, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Amendment 82 and 102, my name, allow ministers to set out in secondary legislation what information must be provided to local transport authorities for the purposes of developing BSIPs and franchises. These serve um, a similar purpose to Amendments 81 and 98 from the Cabinet Secretary. Given local authorities access to the data they need to, to set up BSIPs, is crucial to ensuring these new powers are used. A number of stakeholders raised this issue in evidence to the Committee, and, and I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary has listened to these concerns and uh, the Committee Stage 1 recommendation by bringing forward amendments on this issue. Um, I'm happy to support the Cabinet Secretary's amendments uh, and not press mine, as the Cabinet Secretary's amendments are, are more detailed uh, and certainly cover the issue um, uh, that we're discussing. Thank you. Um, 
No other members have indicated they wish to speak. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to wind up, please? No further comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question, therefore, is, is that Amendment 81 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm now going to move on to the next section, which is bus services, fair work. I'm going to call Amendment 232 in the name of Colin Smith, group with Amendment 242. Colin Smith, can I ask you to move Amendment 232 and speak to both amendments in the group? Thank you very much, Convener. I'm happy to um, move Amendment 232. Um, and to speak on 232 and 242, which call for ministerial direction on the need to incorporate the principles of fair work in BSIPs and franchises. Working conditions and wages in this sector are under constant pressure, and the lack of collective bargaining in the sector has led to a race to the bottom, which has seen bus driver wages fall well below average wages. Significant amounts of public money are spent on bus services. In fact, public money makes up close to half of all bus operator revenue. Given how much public money supports these operators, they should be upholding the highest standards of employment terms and conditions, and we should be using all mechanisms available to ensure this is the case. The introduction of BSIPs and franchises is such a mechanism. I'm conscious that employment is a reserved issue, and I've tried to be mindful of, of that in this amendment. But my approach here is exactly the same one proposed by the government in the recent South of Scotland Enterprise Bill, agreed by members unanimously last week. These amendments do not detail any specific responsibilities. That will be a matter for the direction, though I do, of course, have views on what it should include. This is simply about agreeing that the principles of fair work should be enshrined into these um, particular agreements. And I'm happy to leave it at that. Can Thank you. you. Uh, Peter Chapman, you'd like to speak. Thank you, Convener. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot support either amendment in this grouping. Uh, as fair work is a framework established by this current government, any new government that were to come into power could change this policy and framework, and this would then become redundant. It is therefore not appropriate to refer to this legislation within this bill. Yep. Can you explain why you voted the same, for the same wording when it came to the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill last week? Uh, I can't at this point in time because I can't remember exactly what the, the process was, but I, I, I stick by what I say in, uh, with regards to this bill. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's a debate you can continue later. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, maybe you could um, add to this. I'll try. Convener. Amendments uh, 232 and 242 by Colin Smith seek the, to require the Scottish Ministers to issue directions to local transport authorities requiring them to specify in bus service improvement partnerships and franchising frameworks how each authority uh, or local service operator must seek to promote fair work in exercising its functions. The directions must also set out what fair work means in that context. I support in principle what Colin Smith is trying to do here. The Scottish Government, as the committee knows, supports fair work practices and wishes to promote them as much as practical uh, within the limitations imposed by the Scotland Act reservations to the UK Parliament of Employment and Industrial Relations and within procurement rules. Indeed, Colin Smith's amendments in some respects resemble Scottish Government amendments lodged by Fergus Ewing at Stage 3 of the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill, which passed Stage 3 on Wednesday last week. However, the proposed amendments to the current bill are actually very different to those recently agreed for the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill in light of the different policy and legal context in which they would operate. I therefore have a number of concerns about incorporating similar amendments in these bus provisions. In relation to franchising, I am not persuaded that these amendments are necessary. Franchising will be delivered through franchise agreements. These are regulated procurements in respect of which local transport authorities are already required to have regard to the statutory guidance on addressing fair work practices, including the living wage in procurement. The need for an additional central government direction in the context of franchising is therefore uh, doubtful. In relation to bus service improvement partnership plans, the use of ministerial directions would be quite unusual and arguably inappropriate. In the case of the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill, the context there concerned the duties of a public body, and it is appropriate for ministers to take broad powers to direct public bodies. But in the case of bus provision, we are considering the duties of local transport authorities. 
Most of these are local authorities, and any power to direct a local authority in the exercise of its functions should be appropriately constrained. A ministerial power of direction as potentially broad and far-reaching as is proposed by Colin Smith may risk cutting across local democratic accountability. For that reason, if we were to seek to impose obligations in respect of fair work in this instance, I think it would be more appropriate to do so by means of statutory guidance than by ministerial direction. While I understand why Colin Smith has sought to adapt the Government's own amendments to the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill, this gives rise to some technical issues given the different legal framework created by the Transport Bill. It is not clear whether the Fair Work Directions in this case are intended to be binding on LTAs. It is also not clear whether the ultimate the intention of a direction would be to impose, through partnership schemes, legal duties on bus operators to promote fair work when carrying out their business. Yeah. But given the procedures, I'm happy to give way. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't want to give any um, cause to suspect other than that you want the high standards of employment applying. Um, is it possible that the Scottish Government will come back with an amendment that would incorporate this at stage three? So if the member's patient allows me to finish, I'll come to that particular point as well for him. So, uh, in this issue. But given the procedures and enforcement powers connected to bus service improvement partnerships in particular, it is unlikely these amendments, as drafted, uh, any directions under them could ensure that fair work considerations were effectively taken into account. Again, there is a distinction to be drawn between the amendments and the amendment uh, agreed in relation these amendments and the amendments agreed in relation to the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill, which impose a straightforward power to direct South of Scotland Enterprise uh, and a duty uh, on it to comply with such direction. For these reasons, I cannot support these amendments as they stand. But Given this Government's clear commitment to fair work and to embedding and promoting fair work principles within the limits of our powers and the powers of this Parliament, I today will commit to considering how best we may weave fair work considerations into bus service provisions of the Bill in advance of Stage 3. I am very happy to meet with Colin Smith uh, to work with them on this particular issue. That being the case, I would ask that Colin Smith not to press his amendment 232 and 242, but if these amendments are pressed, uh, to vote against them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Colin Smith, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I am pleased to have reminded the Government of its uh, commitments under fair work and um, given the, the commitment made by the Cabinet Secretary um, to work with myself um, on possible amendments at stage three, um, I will not um, press my amendment and I will invite Peter Chapman to come along to those discussions as well. Sounds very con uh, consensual. Um, as uh, Colin Smith wants to withdraw amendment 232, does any member wish to object? <coughs> Therefore, the amendment is withdrawn. Can I call Amendment 82 in the name of Colin Smith? Already debated with Amendment 81. Colin Smith to move or not move? Um, no. <laughs> I'm on the wrong page. Too many amendments can be done. Not, not move. OK. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure whose instruction you were following. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, oh, OK. <laughs> I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad we clarified that. Can we go and move on to bus services and transport information accessibility? Can I call Amendment 233 in the name of Colin Smith Group with amendments as shown on the groupings? Colin Smith to move Amendment 233 and speak to any other amendments in the group you feel you wish to. Colin. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, all of uh, the amendments in this group are intended to improve accessibility on buses. UK-wide equalities legislation provides a, a floor in terms of accessibility standards, but not a ceiling. We should be constantly looking at ways to improve accessibility in public transport, and this bill provides a number of opportunities to do this. Amendments 233 and 243 would allow BSIPs and franchises to include provisions on accessibility. This is just one of the, the ways we can use the new mechanisms in this bill 
to improve that accessibility. Some local transport authorities already use tendering to deliver more accessible services. These amendments would encourage this to become the norm in the development of BSIPs and franchises. It is crucial that, that BSIPs and franchises deliver improvements for all passengers, including those with disabilities or other mobility issues, and this amendment will help to achieve that. This is not prescriptive in what should, it should involve. I appreciate that different areas may have different particular needs. I do, however, think we should be clear in the face of the bill that this is something these agreements should look at. Amendment uh, 109 uh, would require all new and refurbished bus stops also to be made more accessible. Again, this is about ensuring disabled people are able to use public transport and are able to do so as safely and independently as possible, a name I am sure everyone here shares. Specifically, it aims to remove obstructions and hazards from bus stops requiring step free access. This would also stop the use of floating bus stops where cycle lanes run between the pavement and the bus stop. These are a serious hazard, particularly for blind and partially sighted people. This would not require every bus stop in the country to be altered to meet these standards. It just creates a new standard for new bus stops and others when they are being refurbished. Putting this in legislation will ensure that best practice is consistently followed across the country and we do not have bus stops continue to be developed that are simply not fully accessible. Um, in terms of Amendment 250, Amendment 250 requires bus drivers to undertake disability awareness training on an annual basis. As it stands, drivers only have to do this training on a one-off basis. This creates a risk that the details of this training will be forgotten over time, particularly around scenarios they don't encounter on a regular basis. There is also a risk that best practice will move on and drivers who haven't received any training since the start of their careers will not be kept up to date. Doing this training on an annual basis will ensure that drivers are receiving regular training and always have the most up-to-date information. This regularity will also allow them to raise any questions or scenarios that have occurred during the course of the previous year. This is not calling for intensive lengthy training um, every year. Realistically, we are looking at a day a year, for example, but this is, a, I think, a reasonable ask with the benefit of improving both the experiences of disabled people using public transport and drivers' confidence and capabilities in this area. Uh, amendments 25A and 250B by Jamie Green look to change this so it does not require annual training, but does require training whenever there are significant changes to relevant legislation. My concern is this may undermine the key aim of this amendment, which is to ensure regular training. It is possible for drivers to work for, for long periods of their careers without the relevant legislation changing, during which time they could easily forget details of their training and best practice can evolve. Um, Amendment, I think, 258 by Jeremy Balfour calls for uh, a minister to publish a report on what they have done to ensure that information is accessible and what steps will take based on the recommendations of the report. I think this would be a useful addition to the bill. The issue of accessible information is one uh, I try to address in Amendment 107. It is of huge importance and the work required here would be useful in identifying the gaps and actions needed to ensure this information is accessible. And I think that is uh, all the amendments covered. Can be done. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green, can I ask you to speak to Amendment uh, 109 Alpha and any other amendments in the group, please? It's 190 Alpha. What did yeah. I say? 109. It is 109A. But you can correct me if you like. Okay. Let's um, speak to Amendment 109A. Just to um, clarify, this is stopping places uh, further to call amend calls for amendments. Um, the, I think the, these are two two very substantial substantive issues, and I think I'm pleased that Colin Smith brought them to the chamber today. Um, I think they're very important points. One is about accessibility of bus stops, and the other around driver training and awareness. And I'll, I'll speak to them two separately and explain why, I've dis uh, why I'm trying to amend them, uh, and I hope it's not to be pursued as to weaken the intention behind the amendments. Um, first of all, on 233 and 243, there are lots of numbers that are very similar today. Convener, I apologise. Uh, I'm happy to support both of those um, proposals uh, from the outset. Um, but on uh, stopping uh, uh, places, um, first of all, my amendment 109A uh, simply adds the words where practicable uh, after must. And I think the purpose of that really is, is to agree that we should, if we're building a new bus stop or refurbishing one and, and spending capital on doing so, um, that uh, it should be done in a way that improves the accessibility to and from uh, buses from the stop. Um, but I think we need to give local transport authorities and local authorities some leeway over what can and cannot be done 
uh, when uh, creating uh, stops. I think there's an important point to be made to improve stops, but I think, uh, and I also agree, it would be unreasonable to retro-upgrade all existing stops in their various guises and natures. But I also think it's uh, fair um, that my small amendment adds a pragmatic element to Mr Smith's proposal, because I think it's impossible to preempt every individual circumstance and what they will be when it comes to building, indeed, or what funding is available for uh, uh, new stops or refurbishing stops. Um, amendment 109B removes uh, three of the parameters, uh, additional rules around what must go into the thought process on new stops. And I, I, I actually thought that this whole section in its original wording was perfectly fine uh, up until subsection 2A, uh, and personally I would have stopped the amendment there, because I think up until that point it does uh, say that it, there's a duty uh, that any new stopping places should be accessible um, in accordance with other, other pieces of legislation. But I think it then goes on to be very prescriptive in terms of it should not share any part of a carriageway with a cycle track and uh, mean that it does not require the use of a step. Now, I, I, again, I refer back to my earlier point. I don't know the individual circumstances of every stop uh, that will be built in the future, and there could be hundreds, indeed thousands of them, and I think it would be unreasonable to assume that there may not necessarily be a step involved in every circumstance. There are many older buses that do not have the uh, ability to be uh, retrofitted, for example, to be accessible, but yet many users would still like to use those services uh, with, with other means of assistance. So I think it's too prescriptive. I would uh, perhaps uh, uh, ask members to consider that this is a compromise between the proposal set out in Mr Smith's amendment that I agree with, and, and it's not seen to be seen to be weakening it, but also to make it a little bit more practical in its application. The other important point he makes is around disability training. I think this is an important point. Um, I, again, I support the uh, general principle of improving disability training amongst drivers. Like many other members, we met with stakeholders, including the RNIB, um, who asked us to support this in its entirety. But my two amendments do two things. One is remove the annual requirement. I think it's uh, an overly uh, onerous uh, duty on operators. I can see the merit to continuous training, but I think putting this in the face of the bill uh, means, uh, in effect, the operators would be breaking the law if they were, for any reason, unable to guarantee that all drivers and all bus operators uh, had gone under training every single year. Um, so for that reason, uh, I think we should remove the annual duty but still uh, push ahead with, with the rest of the wording of it. Um, and the final amendment, 250B, uh, looks uh, at also ensuring that there are additional training uh, requirements um, undertaken when significant changes to legislation. I hope that's something that the Minister will, will comment on. And I'll leave my colleague uh, to speak to 258 in his own right. Thank you, uh, Jamie. I now call on Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 258 and any other amendments in the group. Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning. And good morning, Cabinet Secretary and uh, fellow MSPs. Um, can I say, first of all, um, I welcome the, all the amendments within this section. Um, I think they are really helpful um, and hope the uh, committee uh, will support them. Um, if I can speak in um, particular to the amendment that I brought forward in, in Amendment 258, um, there are a number of amendments you will be looking at over the next few days, um, which I have introduced around disability. Um, I think disability and transport is a key issue, and I welcome the moves that this bill makes. Uh, obviously, everybody within this committee want everybody to be able to participate in society, but many disabled people face obstacles that obstruct that right. Public transport often can be the answer to that. Um, I, on a personal issue, I am unable uh, to drive, um, and without public transport, my life would be much more limited. That is true for many people, particularly within rural areas and other parts of Scotland. My amendment here asks the uh, Scottish Government to prepare a report in regard to how we can make transport accessible uh, and the information that is available. Clearly, people who are blind or partially sighted often depend on audio announcements, mobile phone applications or advice from other people. Um, the technology in this area is changing rapidly and I do think it would be helpful to have um, a report and then to see how we can take that forward over the next number of years. 
Um, I don't think this is simply limited to buses. I think there is ways that we can radically change the information that is available for people using trains and other forms of public transport. This not only benefits the disabled person, him or herself, but actually benefits the rest of society. Because if we can have more people using public transport, then there's a carbon footprint, but there's also an economic benefit, because people with disabilities will then be able to go out, uh, spend money, and actually, more importantly, be able to earn money themselves by doing jobs. Uh, the number of disabled charities and people that I speak to who say they would can't simply get to the job because of the transport available. And I think this is a small step in making it more accessible, the information available, um, and I hope uh, both the government and this committee uh, will look favourably upon it. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Mike Rumbles, you've asked to speak on this. Yes, just referring to Jeremy Balfour's Amendment 258, um, where it says Scottish ministers must ensure, effectively ensure that all all information about public transport services is provided in an accessible form. And later in the amendment it says accessible form means, uh, what the minister say it means, but includes the availability of information in audible form. And I just wonder, does this mean audible information must be at every bus stop throughout the land? And how practical is that? Of course. Um, and I think the answer to that is no. Um, it isn't practical at the moment but we don't know where technology is going and that may well become available over the next number of years. But for example, here in Edinburgh, um, if those of you that use Edinburgh buses uh, will know that a lot of bus stops now have information, uh, real-time information. Um, th that could possibly, I understand, be put into audible form already, which would be a step forward. And there are also many other things coming forward in regard to apps and iPhones, which could then also be used to give that information in audible form. So it's not prescriptive that it has to happen, it's asking what is available and what could happen if, uh, if you look at uh, section uh, 1A. I do hear what Jeremy Balfour says, but looking at the words of his amendment, and we have to vote on the amendment or not, it says not later than 12 months after the day of royal assent. This has to be available throughout the land, and I just don't think that's practical. Yes. I, I think you're making a valid point, but mm -hmm. I don't think it says that all the information has to be available in audible form. It says what steps has been taken to ensure that it's available. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that all administration will be available at every bus stop. Um, so I, I do wonder if that's actually a, a better way to approach it. It's not being prescriptive and that all information must be available within 12 months of the passing of the bill. Well, I'm just looking at what it actually says in English in the amendment. It says, not later than 12 months after the day of royal assent, Scottish ministers must publish a report setting out what steps they have taken to en the steps they have taken to ensure that all all information about public transport services are provided in accessible form. And the explanation within the amendment, accessible form means uh, the availability of information in audible form. So I read that as being what it says. Yeah. I'm going to bring in uh, John Finney and then I'm probably going to ask the Cabinet Secretary to see if he can shed some light on it. Uh, Mr Finney, John. Yeah, um, uh, well, I, I hear what um, Mike says there, but, but I, I have to say, I, I don't see it as... I mean, I, I think it would be perfectly competent for the Scottish Minister to say we're aware of this, this developing situation and we're, we're hopefully moving towards that. I think as Jeremy Balfour said that, um, you know, this is an extremely fast-moving situation with... And not everyone has apps on their phone, but um, people with a disability have had great benefit from some apps that are available. And I think this is just... Uh, um, trying to... No other members indicated they wish to speak. Perhaps uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary can shed some light on that uh, and other matters. Okay. Thank you, Convener. The amendment in this group deal with the important issue of accessibility and allow me to begin by agreeing with the importance of making public transport accessible, accessible for everyone. Scottish ministers have made clear their expectations that Scotland's public transport providers will continually improve their performance to help disabled people make better journeys. For our part, this government is taking a whole series of actions and making investments to make that happen. 
from our work to design new trunk road projects inclusively uh, for people with a mobility or sensory impairment to our investment in the National Concessionary Travel Scheme for Disabled People. As we discussed in the context of Bus Service Improvement Partnership plans on the 10th of June, it is worth noting that there is an existing legal framework that currently makes provision about the duties on Scottish public authorities in relation to accessibility. For example, the public sector equality duty set out in the Equality Act 2010 requires public authorities to, among other things, have due regard to the need to advance equality of opportunity between persons who share a relevant characteristic and those who do not. Distinct legal obligations on transport service and infrastructure providers included in respect of accessible information can be found in the 2010 Act and in other passenger rights legislation. These all I'm happy to give away you. Thank you. Um, uh, on the Equalities and Human Rights Committee a couple of weeks ago, we took um, evidence from the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and they told us that the public sector equality duty was not being adhered to in a lot of um, local authorities. So can you give a guarantee that you can put pressure on local authorities and transport services to adhere to that? Well, we already do, uh, but it's also, let's not forget, it is a legal duty uh, which they are required to uh, take forward, and it's important that we continue to press them in doing that. The Equalities Act is the primary piece of legislation that's responsible for ensuring that happens. I'm happy to give way to Mr Smith. Could, could the Cabinet Secretary clarify whether or not that duty um, is a duty on um, regional transport agencies? Are they included in the list of bodies that are covered by that duty, because my concern is that they're not currently covered by it? Yes, they are. Absolutely. All, I'm, all, I'm, all our agencies are I'm advised that, that they are, duty. yes. Uh, convener, uh, with this in mind, um, uh, can I also just point out that uh, all of these um, the mechanisms that, uh, uh, that have just been referred to in terms of the Equality Act, uh, there are provisions for complaints and also for enforcement provisions around them uh, to ensure that they are being appropriately adhered to. Uh, these are uh, duties uh, that the uh, relevant bodies must implement uh, in order to improve accessibility uh, performance. Whilst there is significant existing provision uh, seeking to promote and also secure access to services for disabled people, we should, of course, always take the opportunity to improve matters where there is a need and where this Parliament has the power to do so. Uh, and with this in mind, Colin Smith's amendments 233 and 243 seek to give powers to Scottish ministers by regulation to make provision in a bus service improvement partnership plan or scheme and in a franchising framework for the standards and requirements to be specified in respect of the accessibility of bus services for disabled people and persons with uh, limited mobility. I have noted Colin Smith's views on these amendments and I agree that additional clarity and flexibility in this context may be useful and I therefore ask the committee to support amendments 233 and 243. Amendment 109 from Colin Smith on accessibility of new or refurbished stopping places seeks to amend the Transport Scotland Act 2001 by creating a new duty on local transport authorities to ensure that new or refurbished stopping places comply with the requirements set out in subsection 2A to 2D. The physical location and features of bus stops are the responsibility of roads authorities who are already bound by the Equalities Act 2010 to make reasonable adjustments in exercising their functions, including taking steps to avoid any disadvantage that a disabled person might suffer as a result of a physical feature. They also are bound by general public sector equality duty under the 2010 Act. Roads authorities are therefore already required to ensure that the design and location of bus stops in their area comply with these duties and take into account the needs of users more generally. In addition, provision made in the Public Service Vehicles Accessibility Regulations 2010 ensure that all buses and coaches are made more accessible. There are approximately 4,100 buses in the Scottish fleet, of which 98% are accessible or have low floor buses. Amendment 109 is therefore unnecessary. 
Furthermore, there are a number of technical difficulties which make the legal effect of Amendment 109 unclear. For example, the amendment confers a duty on the local transport authority rather than on the roads authority. It's unclear how local transport authorities could comply with the duty imposed on them, given the powers and functions relating to bus stops are not conferred directly on them. While I can see that Amendment 109A and 109B from Jamie Green are intended to make the duty created in Amendment 109 more focused and proportionate, in my view, the duty would still be unnecessary and would still suffer from technical issues which would make it it make its legal effect unclear. Amendment 250 from Colin Smith relating to disability awareness training seeks to make a further amendment to the Transport Scotland Act 2001, inserting a new duty on operators of local services to ensure that public service vehicle drivers receive disability awareness training annually and require them to publish information as to the steps they have taken in making such training available. This amendment also gives local transport authorities the function of authorising providers of this training. In my view, uh, that it is my view that this amendment is not required as operators of local services have, since March 2018, been required by EU law to ensure that drivers receive dis disability awareness training and I welcome the fact that the UK Government's commitment to publish best practice guidance during the course of this year to assist operators in complying with that training requirement. Amendment 25A and 25B from Jamie Green would alter the duty created by Amendment 250 by removing the requirement for it to be provided annually and providing that the training, and providing that the training needs only be updated when there is a substantial change in legislation relating to disability issues. While well, these amendments are intended to make the duty created more proportionate, I consider that Amendment 250 uh, as it is originally drafted, is not required and, in any event, may fall out of the competence of the Scottish Parliament. Jeremy Balfour's Amendment 258 would require ministers to prepare and lay before Parliament a report about the steps they have taken to ensure the accessibility of information about public services. In doing this, ministers would be required to consult with specific bodies and set out how any recommendations would be handled. Convener, at this point, it is important to recognise what work has already been undertaken in this field and also what reporting arrangements are already in place. As a committee will be aware, this government has been working to improve the accessibility of information in a range of formats for passengers. For example, we have been working with the UK government to design the regulations that will require audio-visual information to be provided on buses, an issue that will be debated in a later group. More broadly, the Independent Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland can advise ministers on any transport accessibility issues affecting disabled people, including through their annual report, which is laid before Parliament. This means there is already a mechanism for doing arm's-length review of these issues. Max is comprised of a majority of disabled people and determines its own work programme. I am not persuaded that an additional reporting requirement in this context will advance practical change. However, I am happy to draw to the attention of Max at this committee's consideration of this issue. For all of these reasons, I would ask uh, Colin Smith not to move Amendment 109 and 250, Jimmy Green not to move Amendment 109A, 109B, 250A and 250B, and Jeremy Balfour not to move Amendment 258. If they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them. However, I would ask the committee to support Colin Smith's amendments 233 and 243. Thank you. Colin Smith, can I ask you to wind up, please, and press or withdraw your amendment? 
Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I think all of the amendments in this group uh, are intended to improve accessibility on our buses in terms of using BSIPs and franchises to ensure vehicles uh, best suit the circumstances, to improve bus stops in terms of accessibility, uh, and to ensure adequate regular training for uh, those driving our, our buses. Um, I welcome the Government's support for Amendment 233 and 243, so I'll therefore move them um, in relation to 109 and, and 250. Um, I'm inclined not to move them. However, I would be keen to have further discussions with the government on how we tackle um, some of the, the difficulties that currently happen in relation to trying to ensure that training for drivers is done on a, a regular basis rather than just a one-off. And I appreciate the UK government are publishing guidance on that wider issue, but also how we avoid um, the current difficulties whereby, for example, we have new bus stops being developed that are simply not accessible and do uh, result in, in, in difficulties for people. For example, floating bus stops where cycle lanes are running between the pavement and, and the bus, they are a hazard to people uh, with visual impairments and we need to look at ways of how we can strengthen the current um, guidance to ensure that these anomalies are not, um, are, 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 are not there. So I reserve the right to bring these amendments back at stage three, but I won't move them at this point and, and hope the government will have discussions on, on, on a way forward. So, sorry, can I just confirm, are you pressing or withdrawing amendment 233? Uh, pressing 233 and... Right, thank you. We'll, we'll come to the others in due course. The question, therefore, at this stage is Amendment 233 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is Section 29 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We now move on to Bus Service Improvement Partnership consultation on making variation and revocation of partnership proposals. I'm going to call Amendment 234 in the name of Jamie Green, grouped with amendments as shown in the grouping. Jamie Green, can you move Amendment 234 and speak to the amendments in the group? Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, it's quite a long grouping, so I'll, uh, I'll keep my comments to my own three amendments in this group. Um, uh, I think that would be helpful in the interest of time. Amendment 234 uh, is around the, what defines a sufficient number of persons uh, is, uh, in terms of uh, ob objections to the creation of a BSIP. Um, can I refer members back to our Stage 1 report on this? And Recommendation 130 uh, talks in detail about um, some of the confusion around how an assessment is made as to what constitutes uh, a sufficient uh, number. Um, the Scottish Government's response to this uh, states uh, that what constitutes a sufficient number will be set out in regulations, and I, I suspect that's what the, the Minister will say to me. However, um, I would advocate that the text of the Bill sets out a general definition of the term sufficient number, but acknowledges that there may be uh, local variation, uh, but that variation should not allow for a definition uh, that effectively um, neuters the provisions intend, intended purpose of allowing bus operators to the opportunity to reject a BSIP and that it regards perhaps as unbalanced. Um, Section 3.0 of the Bill suggests that a sufficient number may be all persons providing local services um, or such a number as uh, to provide a, a proportion of the qualifying local services. And I think this is open to too much interpretation. What constitutes a su sufficient number should be agreed on at the start of the process. And in my view, uh, perhaps the Traffic Com Commissioner would be best placed uh, to decide if the government feels it's not the Traffic Commissioner, I'd be happy if that uh, wording was replaced by, uh, by uh, someone else, but I think that's open to uh, debate. Um, amendment uh, 236 is a consequential to 234. So my next and final substantial amendment is 235. Um, and this is about consultation. Um, Section 3.0 states that if a local authority wishes to postpone any part of a BSIP, they must consult all operators who, must, who may be affected by the postponement, which is fine and good, but it does not state that the local authority must take into account uh, the findings of such a consultation process, or indeed that that consultation process should include, include a discussion on whether postponement uh, of the local authority's commitments should also mean a similar postponement applied to the conditions imposed on operators. Amendment 235 seeks to ensure that due regard is paid to such consultations and hopefully provide some parity between the local authorities and the operators. And I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Uh, can I ask Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 83? 
And any other amendments in the group? Colin. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. As with Amendment 71 in the previous group, and Amendments 83, 85, 87, 89, 91 and 93 expand the consultation and notification processes um, to include people living in the area beyond uh, simply existing service users. Again, this ensures that a wider group of people are able to participate and will help identify the challenges that prevent people from using buses as it stands. We need to increase the number of people using their buses, and that requires engaging with people who, for a range of reasons, may be put off using them at present. Again, amendments 84, 86, 88, 90, 92 and 94 serves the same purpose as amendments 70 and 72 in a previous group. And I've covered the reasoning behind these amendments already, so I'll be brief. These amendments give local transport authorities specific responsibilities around engaging with those living in poverty and those with relevant protected characteristics or developing BCEPs in order to ensure plans deliver for these groups and incorporate their needs and their um, priorities. And I think, convener, that covers um, all my amendments. Thank you. Uh, no other members are speaking in the debate. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener, given the size of this group, there are a considerable number of issues for me to cover in my contribu contrib uh, contribution. I'm afraid Amendment, um, <laughs> Amendment uh, uh, 234 and 236 seeks to address the issue of what will constitute a sufficient number of persons who are operators of qualifying local services to the making, varying or revoking of a BSIP scheme who can object to and potentially prevent that scheme or scheme from progressing. Powers of Scottish Ministers by regulation to specify what constitutes a sufficient number of persons by the remove, it will be removed by Amendment 236. In its place, Amendment 234 will require LTAs to seek the approval of the Traffic Commissioner on what would constitute a sufficient number of persons. The Scottish Government have consistently stated that the issue of what constitutes a sufficient number will be addressed in regulation and will need to, be, need to reflect a wide range of possible scenarios. It is not envisaged at this stage that the sufficient number will be specified in future regulations with reference to a specific number. Rather, it is likely to be calculated according to a formula. Further engagement and wide consultation with all interested parties, including local transport authorities and bus operators, will be undertaken on this issue to ensure that the model uh, fits in a Scottish context, takes account of the market dynamics in Scotland and takes account of the views of operators large and small. Further, it is possible that the formula will require to be modified over time in relation to changing market dynamics. As such, regulations are the most appropriate mechanism for this in order to specify the way the number or the number is calculated, which will allow sufficient clarity, ease of use and transparency of process. The committee at st in its stage one report asked me to carefully consider how this assessment is made. And Mr Green is correct. This is a matter which should be taken forward through regulation making powers, uh, which are included in the bill and which also attracts the affirmative procedure, which, we, which reflects the fact that we give greater significance to the proposed approach to this issue and consider it correct that the regulations in this matter should be endorsed and considered by Parliament. In light of this commitment, I would ask Jamie Green not to press Amendment 234 or to move Amendment 236. However, if they are pressed, I would ask the vote the committee to reject them. Amendment 235 by Jamie Green seeks to insert a provision relating to the postponement of the coming into force of a BSIP scheme. This provision relates to LTAs to have due regard to representations made to them during the consultation process and also consider whether any obligations on operators of local services should also be postponed in these circumstances. I do not think that this amendment is necessary. We would expect, as a matter of good administration, that the LTA will always have due regard to all representations made to them during all the consultation process in the making of a BSIP. This needs not be expressed on the face of the bill in relation to this consultation process individually. Secondly, if a BSIP scheme is postponed, then all the obligations in the scheme are also postponed. As such, the amendment would appear unnecessary. I would ask Jamie Green not to move Amendment 235 if the amendment is pressed. However, I would ask the committee to reject it. 
I believe that Colin Smith's amendments 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93 and 94 are related to his amendments 71 and 72, which have already been considered in the BSIP section in contents on partnership planning grouping. You will recall that Amendments 71 and 72 seek to impose additional requirements as to the content and definition of and consultation on BSIP plans and schemes. As far as plans objectives are concerned, a bill as introduced uh, the bill as introduced gives wide scope to LTAs to set the objectives to be met by BSIP schemes as regard to the quality and effectiveness of services and significant flexibility to set route and service standards to meet these objectives. These objectives and the associated standards may include objectives and standards specifically aimed at meeting the needs of those on low incomes and those and whose ability to use local services is affected by their having to having a protected characteristic. Further, the consultation and notice requirements included in the bill as introduced are extensive. They require general notice of partnership proposals and or proposals to vary plans and schemes in force in such manner as the LTA considers appropriate in order to bring them to the notice of persons in their area as well as specific requirements to consult organisations representing the users of local services. BSIP plans themselves must contain details on how the LTA intend to obtain the views of users of local services as to how well the plan and scheme under it are operating. All of this is considered sufficient to ensure that adequate notice is given to and consultation is undertaken with anybody, including those affected by poverty, who may be impacted by BSIP plans and schemes. Importantly, the approach taken by the Bill as introduced imposes these requirements in a way which is clear and practically achievable. Amendment 83 to 94 would make matters less clear and indeed in some instances would impose duties which are practically un unachievable. In particular, Amendment 84, 86, 88, 90, 92 and 94 would appear to require LTAs to give notice to or to consult a persons who have experience of poverty. Poverty in this context is not defined and would be very challenging to define. But if such a definition were possible, it would be simply impossible to identify, consult and get, give notice to every person who has that experience. Amendments 83, 85, 87, 89, 91 and 93 would require notice to be given to and, con and consultation with organisations appearing to the LTA to be representative of any person living and working in the area who are not users of the local services. Again, this is such, this is such a potentially wide and vague category that discharging the obligation would, in practical terms, be very challenging. Finally, I would add that the consultation on bus service uh, proceedings, the, uh, preceding the bill uh, made clear that quality partnerships and quality contract schemes, which came into force almost two decades ago, were not used because they were considered to place too difficult to put in place. And I don't want to repeat that area with BSP, uh, bus partnership improvement, uh, bus service improvement partnerships. So while I have sympathy with Mr. Smith's aims here, I do consider his intentions to be laudable. I would urge him not to press amendments to from 83 to 94. However, if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Jamie Green, can I ask you to wind up and press your amendment or withdraw it? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for that very uh, detailed and in-depth response to our amendments. Um, the luck of the draw means I get the chance to respond, and I would like to respond. I'm happy to withdraw uh, 234 and 236 based on the information that was given around uh, uh, that this will be set out in regulations um, and it will be subject to the affirmative procedure in, in Parliament. I think that's the right thing to do. Uh, that was perhaps not clear or understood prior to my reading of the bill, so I thank the Minister for that. Um, on the issue of 235, though, and I just want to pick up a point um, as to why I think it's important. Um, as it stands at the moment, uh, on the section of the bill, on consulting of the postponement into the coming into operation of a scheme, it simply says that before making a decision on whether or not to do so, 
local transport authorities must consult all operators who are likely to be affected. But I do pose the scenario, what would happen if all the operators said no to the postponement that the local authority pushed ahead? Now, in your comments, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you did say that there's an expectation on the half, um, uh, uh, that the government has that due regard will be given, but it may be a case that due regard is not given to the responses from the consultation. And that's why I feel, at the very least, Part B of my amendment says that due regard should be given to the represent representations received by them as a result of the consultation is actually quite useful and indeed quite powerful. We do use this language quite often in amendments uh, in legislation that, that there is no point just consulting for consulting's sake. Due regard must be given to the outcome. So I would wonder if, if I was minded to not move it in its entirety, perhaps remove section C and bring this back with the due regard element of it, it may be looked upon more favourably uh, at stage three, and that will probably be my intention, Convener. Thank you. So, uh, Jamie, can I just confirm you've said that you do not wish to press Amendment 234? Not move 234. Okay. So, there is a chance now that we're going to get through so quite a bit, but I just want to go through and say so that, that Jamie Green wants to withdraw Amendment 234. Uh, does any member object? No. No member is jet, therefore the amendment is withdrawn. I call Amendment 83 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith, to move or not move? No, move, convener. The question is that Amendment 83 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, six votes against, therefore Amendment 83 is not agreed. I now call Amendment 84 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith, to move or not move? I move. Sorry? Move. The question is that Amendment 84 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, nine votes against, therefore Amendment 83 is not... Is it 83? Yes. 84 is, is, is not agreed, sorry. I call Amendment 85 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that Amendment 85 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed, therefore there is division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for and nine votes against, therefore Amendment 85 is not agreed. I call Amendment 86 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Let move, convener. The question is that Amendment 86 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division, therefore. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes in favour, nine votes against, therefore Amendment 86 not agreed. Can I call Amendment 235 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 234. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. I th thank you. I therefore call Amendment 87 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 87 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for. There's nine votes against. Therefore, Amendment 87 is not agreed. Can I call Amendment 88 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Yeah, move, convener. The question is that Amendment 88 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We are not agreed. Therefore, there is a division. Can I ask those in favour, please, to raise their hands? Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. No, we can't. Colin, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> there are two votes for, there's nine votes against, therefore Amendment 88 is not agreed. Can I call Amendment 89 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith, to move or not move? It move. The question is that Amendment 89 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. 
There are two votes in favour. There are nine votes against. Therefore, Amendment 89 is not agreed. I call Amendment 90 in the name of Colin Smith already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith to move or not move? Move, convener. <laughs> The question is that Amendment 90 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for. There's nine votes against. Therefore, Amendment 90 is not agreed. Um, can I call these on block? OK. Can I call Amendment 91 in the name of Colin Smith already debated with Amendment 234? Colin Smith to move or not move? We move, convener. The question is that Amendment 91 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. I'll do that as well. <laughs> I'm awake now. <laughs> OK. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 91 is not agreed. I call Amendment 92 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith to move or not move? It move. The question is that Amendment 92 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are nine votes against, therefore Amendment 92 is not agreed. Can I call Amendment 93 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that Amendment 93 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. <laughs> There are two votes for, there's nine votes against, therefore Amendment 93 is not agreed. Call Amendment 94 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 234. Colin Smith to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that Amendment 94 will be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for and there are nine votes against. Therefore, Amendment 94 is not agreed. Can I call Amendment 236 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 234. Jamie Green to move or not moved? Not moved. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, look, let's, let's try this one. The question is that Section 30 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, we will move on to the next section, which is Bus Service Improvement Partnerships, Regulation on Registration of Local Services. I'd like to call Amendment 237 in the name of Neil Bibby, grouped with Amendment 238. Neil Bibby, to move Amendment 237 and speak to both amendments in the group. Neil. Thank you, Convener. Um, Scotland currently has the weakest bus laws in Britain, and this bill is an opportunity to change that. Um, as we've seen this morning, there are different opinions about the extent to which the public sector should own or operate bus services. However, with the bus passenger numbers falling to a record low, there is surely no dispute that new regulations must be introduced into the bus market. And those regulations should shift power from the owners of the big bus companies to passengers and communities. The amendments in this group, 237 and 238, seek to do just that, introduce new regulations into the bus market. It is, by definition, re-regulation. The origin of the amendments in this group can be traced to Strathclyde Partnership for Transport's 10-point plan. The Transport Act 1985 grants ministers regulation-making powers to bring Section 6 of the Act, Registration of Local Services, into effect. The purpose of Amendment 237 is to grant Scottish ministers an additional regulation-making power. The amendment grants Scottish ministers the regulation-making power to limit the circumstances in which an operator may apply to vary or cancel a registration. This allows ministers to make regulations in the interests of passengers which limit the power to operators to withdraw or vary services. That could mean, for example, restricting the dates on which services could be varied or withdrawn. It could mean much stricter regulation. Public transport is a public service. It should be run in the public interest. This amendment seeks to re-establish that principle. Amendment 238 enables regulations to require an operator to make its annual accounts available to the Traffic Commissioner and the Local Transport Authority. In practice, this would allow local transport authorities to determine that operators enjoying an effective monopoly and seeking a public subsidy are not seeking an excessive subsidy or engaging in anti-competitive behaviour. This would go some way to reassuring transport authorities 
about the activities of bus operators. It would also address one of the other key points in the SPT's 10-point plan for bus services, guaranteeing better information with the Transport Authority. I've just, I've just finished. But, oh, yeah. Given that uh, the commercial operators have to lodge their accounts in the public domain via Companies House, is he aware of any uh, operator of such services who does not publish their accounts in the public domain already? I'm, um, I'm, I'm raising these concerns on behalf of the Strathclyde Partnership for Transport, who are, are concerned about um, the, ac the, access of the, the access that they have to accounts to look at how um, bus operators are running um, services, not just their overall accounts, but actually when their claims about ex certain routes being profitable or unprofitable. So I think that is the key question here. It's not the overall um, level of accounts, it is the actual access to see uh, whether claims about the requirement for a subsidy are actually justified or not. And that's all I've got to say. Jamie Green, you asked to speak. Uh, thanks. Just to be on 237, um, my concern is that as it reads, and I'm willing to be corrected in summing up, is that this actually uh, limits the circumstances which an operator uh, can vary or cancel a registration. That's exactly what it says. I'm still a bit unsure as to why the member would want to limit their ability to do so. Uh, so I'd be minded not to support that. But I, I do have some sympathy with 238. I mean, I think Stuart Stevenson made a point in his intervention. These uh, are, accounts are likely to be, not necessarily guaranteed to be, publicly available. I would question whether it's actually annual accounts that you want to see to get the information that you need. I've got no problem with making that information available to the Traffic Commissioner or the LTA or indeed anyone else that sees fit to do. So I, I would you know, be happy to support that, but I do wonder if actually it might be better to bring this amendment back that has, uh, that in detail addresses the concern of SPT, what information is it they think is missing, uh, what do they think they currently do not have access to, and put that in instead, because I don't think actually annual accounts in their, in their top level, macro level, will actually give you any, the sort of information I think that will meet their concerns. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Colin. Thank you very much, Convener. I mean, Amendment 23T obviously gives ministers the power to regulate to limit the circumstances under which an operator can apply to, to vary a council registration. I, I support this, uh, and given ministers the power, I think we have to recognise that passengers are frustrated with ever declining bus service, and I think that, that there may be a need for ministers to introduce tighter regulations on when and how services can be cancelled. I appreciate it's a, a complex area, and so I think it's right that this amendment does not call for anything at this point or, or put anything binding on the face of the bill, but it does enable uh, action to be taken in the future if it's required. In terms of Amendment 238, um, again, it's a regulating uh, regulation making power, um, this time allowing uh, regulations on the need for operators to share their accounts. I think this will help identify instances where competition is not working as it should in an area and where operators are receiving excessive subsidies for delivering a service. I think it's a major problem, but despite the significant amount of money, uh, public money given directly to bus operators, there is a minimum scrutiny of this process in areas where there is an effective monopoly. Like large parts of my own home region in Dumfries and Galloway, it can be impossible for the Transport Authority to know whether the subsidy they are paying out really is fair or not. Again, given this is a complex area, I agree with the approach taken and the decision to put... Yeah, absolutely. Would you actually want uh, the bus company or the private bus company to actually give you information per route on whether it's making a profit or not? Is, is that along the lines of what Mr Bibby is maybe pushing for rather than annual accounts won't tell you in because it will say they made a, a profit of X, but individual accounts on the individual routes may tell you something? Well, the, the amendment itself is, is obviously um, an enabling amendment it would be up to the government to set out exactly what information should be provided. But the big challenge we have is that often a bus is running, um, if there's a monopoly uh, and it's a subsidised service, then that monopoly will effectively say how much that service is going to cost to run. And the exact profit margin is a mystery. You can always guess at it, but we don't know exactly what it is. And sometimes it can be excessive. Um, and, and that is a challenge for regional transport agencies, for local authorities. Are they getting value for money on subsidising these services? And the lack of information makes that incredibly challenging. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, John Finney, sorry. John. Yes, uh, I'm supportive of these amendments, uh, and, and it is for many of the reasons outlined. It is about public accountability. I think the public uh, expect... Uh, the, uh, ser First and foremost, I think there's, there still remains a considerable misunderstanding about the public sector involvement in bus services. It isn't as extensive as many people imagine, but when it is, there is involvement, 
and there is subsidy of routes, then there should be absolute clarity about whether uh, profits are excessive or not. John. Um, Cabinet Secretary. Convener, Amendment uh, 237 by Neil Bibby seeks to amend Section 31 of the Bill. Adding to the amendments uh, it makes to Section 6 of the Transport Act to 1985. Uh, the effect of the amendment would be to enable regulations made under Section 6 of the 1985 Act to make provision limiting the circumstance in which the operator of a service can vary or cancel the registration of that service. Kimina, uh, the provisions of this kind would be unworkable in the context of the existing registration scheme which we have, the role of the Traffic Commissioner and the legislative landscape which underpins these elements. It is also unnecessary as operators are already required to give 28 days notice of any proposal to vary or change a registration and this ensures that local authorities and RTPs affected uh, by such a change can take steps to address any effect this would have on service provision in their area. Amendment 238 would require bus operators to make available annual accounts to the Traffic Commissioner and LTAs as soon as reasonably practicable. It is not entirely clear what the purpose of this amendment is. Operators are already required to satisfy the Traffic Commissioner that they have appropriate financial standing by reference to audited annual accounts as part of the public service vehicle licensing regime. Bus operators, like all commercial companies, publish consolidated annual accounts as a matter of course, and this amendment would appear to add little to that requirement. Uh, the amendment as it stands relates to the publication of annual accounts, not accounts relating to individual routes. Therefore, uh, convener, I would ask Neil Bibby not to press Amendment 237 and 238. However, if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask Neil Bibby for you to wind up, please? Thank and you, press will withdraw your Thank you, sorry. convener. My earlier remarks are referenced to SBT's 10-point plan. Uh, Strathclyde Partnership for Transport is the largest local transport authority in Scotland. Their 10-point plan was launched several years ago to stimulate debate about bus services and influence changes at, in policy at a national level. Their intention and my intention is to deliver a high standard of service to passengers, recognising the role of public sector, but also the restrictions on the public sector through underfunding and deregulation. They believe, and I believe, this will allow us to introduce new regulations into the bus market, which rebalance power away from the bus companies and towards passengers, communities and democratically elected local authorities. Authorities. Uh, for, those for those reasons, I will press both of these amendments. Thank you. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 237 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No, no we're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are nine votes against, therefore Amendment 237 is not agreed. I call Amendment 238 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 237. Neil Bibby to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 238 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. No, we're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are nine votes against, therefore Amendment 238 is not agreed. I now want to look at the uh, Bus Improvement Partnerships Traffic Commissioner powers to scrutinise and I'm going to call Amendment 95 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, in a group on its own, Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 95, please. Convener, the Committee's Stage 1 report stated that the enforcement of compliance with BSIP's mail act balance as the Traffic Commissioner will have jurisdiction to enforce the operator's commitments but not those of local authorities and that in order for a partnership to be truly effective, a level playing field should apply insofar as is possible. To this end, I have brought forward Amendment 95 to the Bill to ensure that the Traffic Commissioner can investigate the actions of a local transport authority in relation to the exercise of its duties in a bus service improvement partnership, prepare and publish a report on the investigation and make appropriate recommendations in circumstances where the Commissioner finds that the LTA is not complying with obligations under the bus service improvement partnership. And I move Amendment 95. 
Thank you. No members uh, asked to speak in this debate. Cabinet Secretary, um, I assume your opening statement was your wind up. Yeah. And therefore, the question is that Amendment 95 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is, therefore, that Section 31 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm now going to move on to the um, Franchising Framework and Franchising Agreement uh, and the content of that. I'm going to call Amendment 213 in the name of Jamie Green. Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Jamie Green, can I ask you to move Amendment 213 and speak to all amendments in the group? Uh, thanks, Convener. I hope members will bear with me. I know it's been a long morning. Um, these are largely quite technical amendments. 213. Uh, is, uh, I think, quite self-explanatory. Um, it re requires that a franchise framework must include a provision as to how disputes can be resolved between the local transport authority and the service operator. Uh, this is fairly standard practice in most commercial contracts of this nature, and I think uh, it's normal to predetermine dispute resolution mechanisms, and I'm hoping uh, that the Minister will look favourably upon uh, this addition. 214. Um, I also think it's important, given the, how expensive uh, a business it is to operate a, a franchise um, and the pressure it will put on local authorities who wish to pursue such models. We talked a lot about this uh, as we took evidence at stage one. Uh, the bill already states, it's true to say, that the local authorities must set an analysis of the financial implications of making the framework. My amendments go a little bit further and add some specific detail. Uh, in that assessment, which includes an assessment of the costs to establish and run a service, the projected profitability or not, as the, as the case may be, and a com importantly, in a comparative analysis of how the proposed framework will impact how services are currently funded. And by that, I mean local authorities who are already subsidising services through other mechanisms. If they were to move to a different model, how the uh, moving of funds from that subsidy to uh, operating a, a new service would be impacted by doing so or by making that move. And really the intention of that amendment is to ensure that the financial assessment uh, has been performed and published to the, the highest possible standard. So I'll be keen to hear some thoughts on that. 239. Uh, this amendment states that the auditor of the franchise should be appointed by the traffic commissioner. Um, and the reason for that is, I think, uh, that um, I think given uh, that local authorities by their very nature um, can be uh, political, um, I think uh, an authority that has begun the process of introducing a franchise um, should not be the body to appoint an auditor of the process. I think neutrality is absolutely essential in what could be perhaps a contentious environment. I think the appointment of the auditor should fall to the traffic commissioner, in my view. I think that's a role which is independent and highly regarded. Um, and I, I, th I think this would mirror the bill's provision that the commissioner uh, appoints the panel to consider the final pr franchise proposal. Therefore, they should also consider the auditor. That's the point of 239. And finally, 240. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, this is uh, going back to the issue of postponement. I appreciate it's in this grouping. Um, there, I don't think there's any, uh, again, we said no clear guidance as to where an authority has to pay due regard to the consultation process. But I think any operator, be, be they the winner of a franchise or not, would be able to adjust for example, at short notice to the postponement or variation of a franchise if they've already made significant capital investment in such. Unlike within a partnership agreement, uh, the imposition of a franchise may mean uh, that an operator uh, has to take significant uh, changes to their business. Meanwhile, a successful bidder may have uh, invested a considerable resource. Um, these are decisions which cannot be wound back by an operator and the operator would be left with costs thereof. So this amendment uh, makes it clear that if an authority decides to postpone or vary a franchise framework, then there should be sensible consultation uh, on if or how the local authority might seek to compensate operators for any losses uh, as a result of the postponement. Um, I'm happy to stop there. Thank you, Jamie Cullen, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 96 and any other amendments in the group, please? Thank you very much, Convener. Um, amendment 90, um, 96 um, serves the same purpose to amendments already debated in previous groups in relation to BSEPs. It requires consultation specifically with those living in poverty and those with relevant protected characteristics as part of the development of franchise, an area that I have to say the current bill uh, falls very short when it comes to tackling those issues. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Convener, Amendment 213 seeks to add, add to Section 13A3 of the 
Transport Scotland Act 2001. A requirement for a franchising framework must include provision on how disputes between a local transport authority and a person operating local services in the area of the framework are to be resolved. It is also not clear uh, what type of uh, disputes would intend to be captured by this provision. Uh, further, it is a franchise agreement that creates the contractual relationship between the LTA and an operator of a local service under a franchise, and that is where it would be more appropriate that dispute resolution uh, should be used to address the matter. LTAs uh, would require to keep a franchise framework under review. Uh, and complaints from operators, franchisees or not, uh, and anyone else, such as uh, bus users, should form part of this. Um, I therefore ask Jamie Green not to press Amendment one, uh, 213, uh, and if the amendment is pre uh, pre pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. Amendment 96 by Colin Smith seeks to require an LTA to put mandatory conditions on how the needs of certain persons will be provided for in the contractual franchising agreement with the operator providing a franchise service. This is similar to Amendment 70, considered in an earlier grouping, although, uh, although that related to uh, BSIP, the BSIP model. As with BSIP, I believe that the franchising process will address this in a better way uh, at a far earlier stage. The franchising process is deliberately a very thorough exercise of development, assessment, audit, consultation and application for approval. Proper analysis of the needs of local bus users would be considered as a key, key part of any engagement process at an early stage in developing such a proposal. That analysis would include consideration of the needs of persons with low income, whose income is adversely affected, whose expenditure is increased or whose experience of, uh, or ability to use local services is likely to be affected because they have one or more of the protected characteristics uh, far before the point of entering into uh, the agreements. I therefore ask Colin Smith not to press Amendment 96. However, if it is pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. Amendment 214 by Jamie Green seeks to add to Section 13E2 of the 2001 Act a requirement that the financial assessment carried out by the LTA on the proposed franchising framework includes certain specific information. This is the type of thing that we would certainly expect uh, to be in a financial assessment. As part of the implementation of the bill, Scottish ministers must issue guidance in relation to an assessment of a proposed franchise framework. This guidance will be extremely detailed and will cover the things the amendment suggests. It is important to do this in guidance rather than by a firm rule in the Bill, as the guidance will be developed with, the stakeholders in, with stakeholder engagement and will allow for adaptability as practice develops. I have therefore asked Jamie Green not to press Amendment 214. Amendment 239 by Jamie Green seeks to amend Section 13F2 of the 2001 Act, inserting by Section 32 of the Bill to the effect that the Traffic Commissioner, instead of the local authority, Transport Authority would appoint and obtain the report of an auditor of the financial aspects of the assessment of a proposed franchise framework. Auditors are a regulated profession and legislation contains detailed provision on statutory audits and their obligations. Additionally, it is the LTA who requires to consider the report of the auditor to determine if they, can, they are to proceed with the proposed franchise framework, not the Traffic Commissioner. I think that the proposal in Amendment 239 would represent a further unnecessary stage for anyone considering franchising uh, to have to undertake. The provision of, provisions of the Bill are already robust, and I do not see the need to make the process any more difficult than is necessary. This would clearly have, of course, the financial and resource implications for the Traffic Commissioner, which have not been considered or discussed with the UK Government as they fund the Commission's function. I would therefore ask Jamie Green not to press Amendment 239. However, if it is pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. Amendment 240 by Jamie Green seeks to add a requirement for an LTA to consult operators of local services who are likely to be affected on how to compensate those operators when the LTA seeks to postpone either the commencement of a franchising framework or a variation 
of a franchising framework. There is already a requirement on an LTA to consult operators of local services who are likely to be affected when they are considering the postponement of uh, the coming uh, into operation of a franchise framework or a variation to an existing one. This amendment seeks to add in a requirement to consult on how the LTA proposes to compensate those operators. To add an obligation to consult as to proposals for compensation would not create anything more than a consultation duty and would create the expectation that operators would be entitled to something that there was no basis for. Postponement can only be for up to 12 months, so there is a finite amount of time this effect can last for operators, and Scottish ministers have the powers to amend this period should practice show it is unsuitable. Franchising is a big and potentially very costly intervention in the bus market, which will have, which will have taken a very lengthy time to get to this stage. It is vital to give LTAs the opportunity to deliver it properly and have reasonable postponement where necessary. The obligation is currently in the bill to consult operators who may be affected is adequate to cover all scenarios without adding an undue burden on LTAs of considering compensation and creating an unrealistic expectation for operators. And I therefore ask Jamie Green not to press Amendment 240. However, if the amendment is pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Jeremy Green, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment? Uh, thanks, Convener. Just very briefly, um, 213, I take on board the uh, Cabinet Secretary's point on that. On 214, though, um, I mean, in many answers to some of my amendments, it's, we're given the answer that this will all be dealt with in guidance and that guidance needs flexibility. I think that's, that's all well and good. Um, but the, the things that I've added in here, I think, would, be, would, would form a sensible foundation uh, for that guidance, I mean, at which point would it be inappropriate um, for these items not to be uh, in the uh, financial reporting? Um, and I appreciate that the, the minister wants the flexibility to change the guidance as he sees fit, but these are just the, the basics that I think they should be in, in those assessments. So um, I don't think they're particularly onerous requirements and may be there anyway, but this would underpin them being there. Um, I, I hear what he says on 239, but my question remains, and I don't think that question has been answered, is who appoints the auditor? I appreciate uh, the rest of the response given, but it's still unclear as to whether that would be the local, uh, the local transport authority themselves or indeed um, a, a, a other body. Um, and I take on board his point about 240 as well, and I wouldn't move that. So, uh, convener, 213, not move. OK, so Jamie Green wishes to withdraw Amendment 213. Does any member object? There's no objection, so the, member, uh, the amendment's withdrawn. I'd like to call Amendment 96 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 213. Colin Smith, to move or not move? We move, convene. The question is, Amendment 96 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. If there is a division, those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes in favour. There's nine votes against. Therefore, Amendment 96 is not agreed. I'd like to call Amendment 214 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 213. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move. I therefore call Amendment 239 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 213. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move. Right. We're going to go on to the next section. And can I just say that... Uh, to members of the committee that I'm trying to work out timings for this. There is some benefit from trying to push on slightly so that either Neil Bibby and, and uh, Jeremy Balfour don't have to come back this evening to move their amendments. Um, I, I realise that may be some pressure, but I'm asking for a wee bit of flexibility to see how far we can go. So. I'd like to push on with the minor technical amendments and call Amendment 97 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, Group with Amendment 99, 100 and 101. I point out that if Amendment 215 to be debated in the next group is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 99, 100 and 101. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move Amendment 97 and speak to the other amendments in the group? Convener, Amendment 97, 99, 100 and 101 are minor in nature. The correct terminology used in Section 32 of the Bill. Amendment 97 and 100 replace the word franchising with franchise in Section 13L2 and 
are 2A of the Transport Scotland Act 2001, Amendment 99 and 101, and in reference to franchise agreement in sections 13R1 and 13R2, uh, which is not quite correct. Can we move Amendment 97? Thank you. Uh, sorry. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, now the members asked to speak in that, uh, in this debate, so Cabinet Secretary, um, I'm sure you feel you've said enough. Yep. Uh, on that basis, the question is, Amendment 97 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 240 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 213. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move. Uh, I call Amendment 98 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 81. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 98 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So we're going on to multi-authorities and regional transport partnerships. I'm going to call Amendment 215 in the name of Jamie Green, grouped with Amendment 241. I point out that if Amendment 215 is agreed, I cannot call Amendments 99, 100, 101 due to a preemption. Jamie Green, can I ask you to move Amendment 215 and speak to both amendments in the group? Jamie. Uh, thanks. There's only one amendment uh, that I've got here, thankfully. Uh, it's about multi-authority franchising. Uh, it adds a new section into the bill. At the moment, um, the uh, bill allows multi-authority franchising, which is made up of two or more local authorities. Um, I've copy-pasted that wording, you'll be pleased to note, and simply added in two additional uh, bodies to that one is uh, regional transport partnerships and Scottish ministers. Uh, you're probably asking yourself why. Um, in effect, I think this uh, just want to expand this power. Um, I think Colin Smith's um, version of this also allows regional transport partnerships to create franchises. I think that's a sensible thing. I take it a slightly step further and give it more flexibility. I think there could be a whole number of variations within local authorities and indeed regional transport partnerships um, coalescing around uh, the setting up of a franchise. There may be technical reasons why that's not possible or indeed not helpful. Uh, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will inform me of such. But I, to give you just one practical example uh, that I think maybe puts some substance to this, at the moment, uh, if you want to get from Adrossan to Edinburgh by bus, it takes three and a half hours. Uh, it involves three separate bus operators and requires two interchanges. In that scenario, if no single private commercial operator wanted to intervene and run a direct service between Adrossan and Edinburgh, um, as is the case between Greenock and Edinburgh, for example, then it could, be, it could it be the case that North Ayrshire Council, SPT and, say, Glad Edinburgh City Council uh, wish to set up such a route, uh, uh, indeed jointly fund such a route and operate such a route uh, as a franchise. Um, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that my amendment gives them the ability to do that if such powers do not currently exist in the bill, and I'm keen to hear any feedback as to whether this is a helpful addition or a cumbersome one. Thank you. Uh, Colin Smith, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 241 and any other amendments in the group? Thank you very much, Convener. Amendment 241 in my name allows regional transport partnerships to run franchises as opposed to just Model 3 RTPs, which is, uh, I think, what the current bill uh, allows. Um, this serves two pur purposes. Firstly, on a practical level, this was intended to complement my amendment looking to lift the ban on councils running bus services. In this scenario, some have argued that there may be a potential conflict of interest in councils competing for franchises they are tendering, and I believe this amendment would be one way forward to try to uh, avoid this, um, although I, I would question the full extent to which there is that potential conflict of interest. But an RTP awarding a franchise in the same way that current RTPs, for example, um, uh, that are Model 3, are able to, 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 you know, to, to subsidise services. Um, however, the amendment also um, uh, is aimed at facilitating a more regional approach to transport uh, in a broad sense. Transport always requires cooperation across local authority borders, and there will be instances where it is more appropriate for a franchise to be run at a regional level. However, as things currently stand, only three RTPs, which is SPT, Swiss Trans and Trans, will have the power to do that. Uh, amendment 215 by Jim Green also looks at the role of regional transport partnership in franchises. I'm not sure of the proposed role of ministers here, and indeed I'm not sure whether it is necessary for multiple RTPs to have the power to act jointly on this matter, but I'll, I'll listen to what other members have to say. I think the key thing is, is to give um, RTPs and all RTPs the power um, to award and, and run franchises. Thank you, Colin. No other members indicated they wish to speak in this group. Cabinet Secretary. 
A, amendment 215 by Jamie Green and Amendment 241 by Colin Smith seek to include regional transport partnerships alongside local transport authorities as parties able to act jointly to make a franchise framework and franchise agreement. Amendment 215 also seeks to extend this to include the Scottish Ministers. Thus, I agree with what I think is the principle behind these amendments, that where relevant local authorities deem it appropriate, powers should be able to be made available to the relevant RTPs. Uh, these, re re these amendments are not necessary or appropriate. Scottish ministers have existing powers to transfer any function they consider appropriate to RTPs by an order made under Section 10 of the Transport Scotland Act 2005. The bill goes even further to make this clear and specifically amends the list of functions in Section 10 of that Act to include the new franchising function. This allows the Scottish Ministers to do so as and when appropriate and by following the procedure of making a statutory instrument that is laid in the Scottish Parliament. The bill as a whole has been drafted in a way to be future-proofed for consideration in the review of the National Transport Strategy around transport governance. It does not attempt to preempt those considerations. I would add that there is no role for Scottish Ministers in local services franchising, which is a local matter designed to address local bus needs, and it is appropriate that it is delivered by local transport authorities. It is also important to ensure that the decision panel's role is decisive. Scottish Ministers will engage with all stakeholders in producing guidance and regulations to support the franchising process to ensure that it is open, fair and transparent but as such they cannot be said uh, to be impartial in producing a framework, nor should they enter into specific agreements. With this in mind, I would ask Jamie Green not to press Amendment 215, and I would ask uh, Colin Smith not to press Amendment 214. However, if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Uh, I'm still a bit confused uh, if, if uh, local authority and the Regional Transport Partnership could create a franchise and operate a service together under existing legislation, or whether it would require changes to the powers that they have um, via statutory instrument. If that's the case, why don't we just put it on the face of the bill now and be done with it, would be my question. If the Cabinet Secretary can respond, it might be helpful whether I push it or not. I'm, as I said, I'm still unclear as to whether they can do the scenario that I mentioned. It depends on the circumstances. So if it was S SPT, it may be that they would require that um, authority. Um, uh, but in other instances, it may not apply. So there's not, a, there's not a clear, specific answer to that. It depends on the circumstances. OK, that's clear-ish. Um, in that case, um, I'll, I'll continue to move my amendment on that basis. OK. Th thank you very much. I remind members that if Amendment 215 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 99, 100 and 101. And the question, therefore, at this stage is Amendment 215 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are four votes in favour. There are seven votes against. Therefore, Amendment 215 is not agreed. I would like to call Amendments 99, 100 and 101, all debated in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all, pre sorry, all, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I would like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to move the Amendments 99, 100 and 101 on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put? Uh, to amendments 99, 100 and 101. No. Okay, the question therefore is that amendments 99, 100 and 101 are agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendment 241 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with amendment 215. Colin Smith to move or not move? Let move, convener. Thank you. Therefore, the question is amendment 241 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. 
There are five votes in favour. There are six votes against. There are, therefore, Amendment 241 is not agreed. Can I call Amendment 242 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 232. Colin Smith to move or not move? No, move. The question is that Amendment 242 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. <laughs> Thank you. There are two votes for. There are nine votes against. Therefore, Amendment 242 is not agreed. I call Amendment 102, in, <coughs> sorry, in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 81. Colin Smith to move or not move? Yeah, move. The question is that Amendment 102 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, there are six votes against, therefore Amendment 102 is not agreed. I call Amendment 243 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with uh, Amendment 233. Colin Smith to move or not move? Yeah, move. The question is that Amendment 243 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 32 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Now. I'm going to move on to the provision of information about local services and I'm going to call Amendment 244 in the name of Neil Bibby, grouped with amendments as shown in the grouping. Neil Bibby to move Amendment 244 and speak to all amendments in the group. Neil. Thank you, Kivina. Um I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, there are a number of amendments in this group. I wish to speak to amendments 244 and 246 in my name and briefly comment on those amendments lodged by other members. The purpose of amendment 244 in my name is to clarify that bus operators must share information on patronage and revenues with the local transport authority. Currently, the bill will require operators to share information relating to the number of passengers using the service, journeys made, fares paid and revenue obtained. I want to test the adequacy of the term relating to in this section of the bill. My amendment instead uh, requires operators to share information setting out passenger numbers, bus journeys, fares paid and revenues. I believe this clearer, more precise wording could help clarify what requirements will be placed on operators. Nonetheless, I will uh, listen to the explanation from the Minister on the language used on the bill as introduced. Amendment 246 is more substantial. This amendment places a duty on local authorities to notify the Traffic Commissioner about a change of bus route or significant change to timetabling. It also sets out how the Traffic Commissioner should respond to such a notification. That includes establishing a panel of three to determine whether to approve the change, and it requires a panel to consult with the Transport Authority, bus operators and, most importantly, bus users. This amendment not only shifts power from the bus operators back to the community, but it guarantees passengers a say over significant changes to local services. The committee will also note Amendment 247 in the name of Colin Smith, which would have a similar effect. It establishes a statutory duty to consult about change of bus routes or timetabling. This bill represents a significant opportunity to give voice to bus passengers. That is the purpose of these amendments, and I would encourage members of the committee to support them. Regarding the amendments in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, these do appear to be uh, largely practical uh, amendments, either of a technical amendments or consequential nature. Uh, there, however, may be a concern about Jamie Green's Amendment 245. This appears to place restrictions on information sharing that are not necessary and not consistent with the spirit of the bill, but I'm sure members, committee members will, of course, listen to his explanation for the amendment and consider the case he makes. To conclude, convener, I would ask the committee to consider those amendments which bring democracy and accountability to public transport and enhance the power and position of passengers. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 103 and any other amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener, the effect of Amendment 244 would be to narrow the power which at present covers information relating to the matters referred to in subsection 3, as so uh, that it would only cover information setting out the matters referred to in that subsection. Setting out could be read, for example, as only aggregate patronage figures, whereas information relating to patronage could be considered to include data on concessionaries and other broader demographic information, which would be likely to be more useful. 
I believe that the bill as introduced strikes the right balance to ensure requests are not too onerous for operators to provide, uh, whilst uh, giving sufficient flexibility through the regulation making powers to ensure local authorities can get the details they require to make informed decisions as to the effect of such a variation or cancellation and the steps may be required uh, to take to address any effect on service provision in their area. The consultation requirements apply to the power uh, to make regulations under subsection 3 add a level of protection to ensure this balance is achieved. Government Amendments 103, 104 and 105 are technical amendments uh, to new section 6ZB2 and 3 of the Transport Act 1985. Those sections make provision for affected authorities to disclose information received from a bus operator who propose to cancel or vary a registration, a registered local bus service to specify to specified persons in connection with an invitation to tender to provide a supplementary or replacement service. These amendments will ensure that the disclosure provisions work effectively, regardless of which procurement procedure the affected authority chooses to use. Government Amendment 106 is a consequential amendment to Section 43 of the Transport Scotland Act 2001 and resolves a potential conflict in the way in which the provisions about disclosure of information requested under Section 43 would operate where that information is provided, together with information requested under new Section 67A of the Transport Act 1985. Government Amendment 108, relating to the provisions being added to the Transport Scotland Act 2001, which will allow the Scottish Ministers to make regulations requiring bus operators, local transport authorities and the Traffic Commissioner to share certain information on routes, timetables, fares, tickets and the operation of services with speci specified people. The amendment will allow those regulations to specify the Secretary of State as a person who may receive spe specified information, specific information. This would allow the Scottish Ministers to ensure that such information is as is required for the effective operation of the UK-wide bus information system known as NAPTAN is shared with the UK Government who administer that scheme. The information is to be shared, uh, be shared will be set out in regulation. Amendment 245 from Jamie Green seeks to restrict the information that operators can be required to provide about the operation of their service in the past under the, those regulations to information from the past two years. In order to reduce the burden on information providers, it is understandable that requests for past information should not span an unreasonable period of time. However, given the range of circumstances in which information may be required, I do not consider it to be practical or appropriate to set an arbitrary time limit in primary legislation. Regulations requiring the provision of information can only be laid before Parliament after the consultation requirements in new section 35A8 of the Transport Scotland Act 2001, as inserted by section 34 of the bill, have been complied with. There will therefore be full engagement with bus operators before the precise scope and nature of the information they are to be required to share is finally determined. These regulations will attract affirmative procedure and so there will be appropriate parliamentary scrutiny of that requirement. Amendment 107, in Colin Smith's name, seeks to allow regulations made under the new section 35A to require information to be made available in accessible formats, including audible formats and braille. It's not clear whether Mr Smith intended, is intended by uh, this amendment that the regulations should be able to compel operators to make this information available to the end user, namely passengers. If that is his intentions, I do not consider that the amendment would have the desired effect. More fundamentally, the Secretary of State already has a power under Section 181A of the Equality Act 2010 to, by regulations, require operators of local services in Scotland make information available to persons travelling on those services for the purposes of facilitating travel by people with a disability. It would be out with the competence of this Parliament to confer a power of a similar nature on Scottish ministers. However, my officials have been liaising with the DFT officials on how these accessible information regulations should be designed so far as they relate to Scotland and supported consultation and engagement activities with Scottish stakeholders. 
This is in addition to the formal consultation response that issues uh, from Scottish ministers to the DFT on the subject. Amendment 246 from Neil Bibby imposes a requirement on LTAs to notify the Traffic Commissioner about a proposed change of a bus route or substantial timetable change. It would also require such changes to be considered by a panel appointed by the Traffic Commissioner. Operators are already obliged to apply to the Traffic Commissioner to make changes to a registered service. The number of registered applications uh, of all kinds over six weeks from in April to May was 254. The number of routes and timetable changes which would require to be notified and considered under this amendment could therefore give rise to a significant administrative burden on LTAs and the Traffic Commissioner and operators. However, more fundamental issue, I'm happy to give way to the member. Um, I'm, I'm grateful the Cabinet Secretary taking uh, that intervention. Would he, he quoted a number of statistics there. Is it likely that uh, um, the disruption that's caused by a lot of these alterations, there's less likely to be these changes if there were this regime in place? Um, that doesn't necessarily follow. Uh, the issue is likely to be is that those who are required to consider it have to undertake a significant amount of work uh, to consider any application for a change in registration, uh, which is a fundamental point about this particular amendment. Uh, because, uh, for example, the Traffic Commissioner uh, that would have to give consideration to this uh, uh, it, it would have to consider the resource implications, uh, such a significant increase in their workload would require to give consideration to these matters, an issue which has not been given consideration, given that the Commissioner is actually funded by the UK Government uh, in supporting them and discharging uh, their function. Therefore, I believe that such provisions is also unnecessary, as operators are already required to give 28 days' notice to an affected authority of proposals to change or vary a registered service. This allows authorities to assess the changes and impact on local bus planning, provide an opportunity for discussion with operators and other stakeholders, and for authorities to take steps to address any effect on service provision in their area, for example, using existing powers to secure the provision of services required to address unmet transport needs in their area. The Bill will expand the options available in such circumstances, for example, by making provision for local authorities to run services. It should also be noted that there are a number of technical issues with the amendment which would mean that its, effect, its legal effect is unclear. For example, subsection 4 provides that the panel may decide not to approve the proposed change of a route or timetabling, but no provision is made as to the effect of such a decision. In addition, the amendment would place these new requirements affecting the operation of the system of local service registration in a new section 35A of the 2001 Act. The legislative provisions underpinning the registration system are found in section 6 to 9 of the Transport Act 1985. And it's for these reasons that I believe that the amendments are therefore not necessary or appropriate. Amendment 245 from Colin Smith would impose a duty on operators to consult with local transport authorities, bus passengers and other relevant parties about changes of bus route or timetabling. Changes of the type referred to in this amendment would require an operator to apply to vary the, the registered service. Operators are already required to notify LTAs of a proposal to vary a registered service in terms of the Public Service Vehicles Re Regulations 2001. This ensures early communication between operator and the local transport authority, following all available following all, allowing all available options to be explored. As such, I believe the amendment is therefore not necessary or appropriate. Amendment 173 makes a technical adjustment to section 135 of the Transport Act 1985, resolving a potential overlap in the consultation requirements applying when Scottish ministers propose to make regulations under the new section 67A, 6ZA and 6ZC of that Act. The remaining amendments are minor in nature in providing further clarification in the Bill. Uh, and I'd ask Neil Bibby not to uh, press Amendment 244 and 246, Jamie Green not to press Amendment 245 and Colin Smith not to press Amendment 107 and 247. But if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Jamie Green, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 245, please? And other amendments in the group, sorry. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with the Cabinet Secretary's comments and I will not move my amendment. 
Thank you. Uh, can I ask Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 107 and any other amendments in the group? I, I hope Jamie Green um, meant only in his amendment, of course, because I'm sure he'll fully support Amendment 107 in my name, which is to require public service uh, information to be made available in accessible formats. This relates to information provided to the public rather than the information shared under the specific provisions in this section, but the legislation team advised that this uh, will have the effect of delivering these changes. The sale people who are uh, in some way prevented from driving often rely on public transport to get around, but they can face significant barriers in access. And one key example of this is the ability to access basic information such as timetables. Without this information, some people will realistically be prevented from public transport, which in turn limits their ability to access any other services or opportunities that they need public transport to get to. This amendment calls for information to be made available to the public in accessible formats such as large font, audible and braille. It does not require every operator to automatically have every piece of information they publish translated into every possible format, just that it should be available as needed and requested. This would simply ensure that deaf people and visually impaired people can access the same basic information that most people will take for granted. I am aware, and I think the Cabinet Secretary touched on that, changes uh, enabled in the Bus Services Act 2017 have been introduced around information for bus passengers. However, as I understand it, these provisions primarily relate to the information available during the journey, not prior to it, which is what this amendment looks at. The Cabinet Secretary also indicated that officials were liaison, I think, with the UK Government on um, accessible information, but there was no um, information there as to what they were actually asking for. It is not clear to me uh, what the Scottish Government's position is on this. I think it is a basic right that if somebody who has a disability needs information on a bus timetable, such as uh, in Braille or in an audible format, then there should be an obligation to provide that. Uh, and, and Amendment 107 in my name uh, will achieve that. Can I well, give I an intervention? We can, yeah. um, Noting that uh, in Peterhead Academy there are 28 languages in the school, would this require them to provide uh, information in an accessible form, in other words, in another language, because not all the 28 languages uh, people uh, can actually speak English? This particular amendment refers um, uh, directly to people with a, with a particular disability who require, for example, Braille or, or audible format. However, if Mr Stevenson wants to bring forward another amendment at stage no, no, three no, no. to achieve um, support for his uh, residents in Peterhead, then I think it is worth considering. Okay. Amendment 247 requires uh, bus operators to consult on any changes to uh, bus routes. As it stands, operators only have to consult on changes to subsidise routes when changing commercial services. They only have to notify um, the Traffic Commissioner. I think this means the public. Well, this does mean the public do not get advance notice uh, or an opportunity to respond to changes to vital services purely because they are commercial routes. It's simply not the same to say that because a bus operator informs the authorities, which I think was the phrase the cabinet secretary um, used, the public will automatically know that that change is is taking place. Too often, the public find out there's been a change to a bus service when they pick up a timetable and discover that their commercial bus service has been axed in a particular area and they have no say whatsoever on what that route change should actually be. This amendment will change that. There are too many instances where the first passengers know not only is when the, the, the bus simply does not arrive. Some bus companies do carry out consultation, but this is in an ad hoc way, and it varies in terms of, of quality. It is an issue that every single member in this parliament will receive complaints about, and we have an opportunity to tackle that issue as this transport bill goes through, and simply saying that authorities will be told in advance about a change is not the same as passengers. Amendment 246 by Neil Bibby likewise looks to strengthen bus operators' responsibilities in this regard and sets out a specific process for how to do this. I am happy to support either approach, depending on what the committee prefers, but the principle of proper consultation is something that we need to start to put in place uh, if we are going to fully support and encourage people to use our bus services. Thank you. Uh, can I ask uh, no other members are speaking in the debate. Sorry, I should have checked that first. Uh, Neil, could I ask you to wind up and press and withdraw your amendment, please? Thank you, Convener. As I indicated, the purpose of Amendment 244 was to clarify the requirement we are placing on operators and consider whether this could be strengthened. Uh, having reflected on, these, on the comments by the Cabinet Secretary, I will not press Amendment 244. 
Um, Amendment 246, however, represents more than just a duty to notify the Traffic Commission about changes to a bus route or major change to timetable. It requires consultation with operators and bus users, and it allows a panel to reject a change to a registered service. I believe it helps rebalance the power in the bus market. For those reasons, I will press Amendment 246, and I hope members will also consider supporting Colin Smith's amendments. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Neil Beebe wishes to withdraw Amendment 244, I have to ask if any member wishes to object. No, no one wishes to object, therefore the amendment is uh, withdrawn. I'm now going to call amendments uh, 103, 104, 105 and 106, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary to move amendments 103 to 106 on block, please? Moved. Does any member object to a single big question being put on amendments 103 to 106? No. Therefore, the question is, are we agreed to amendments 103 to 106? Yes. yes. Jumping the gun there, Mr Lava, we are agreed. Therefore, the question is that section 33 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 245 in the name of Jeremy Green, already debated with amendment 244. Jeremy Green to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 107 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 244. Colin Smith to move or not move? I move. Mm -hmm. The question is that Amendment 107 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed. There's division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, six votes against, so one, Amendment 107 is not agreed. Can I call Amendment 108 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 244. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 108 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 246 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 244. Neil Bibby, to move or not move? Move. The question therefore be that amendment 246 be agreed are we all agreed no. we're not agreed there's a division those in favor please raise their hands and those against please raise their hands there are two votes for there are nine votes against therefore amendment 246 is not agreed i call amendment 247 in the name of colin smith already debated with amendment 244 colin smith to move or not move yeah, move the question is that Amendment 247 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for. There are nine votes against. Therefore, Amendment 247 is not agreed. The question is that Section 34 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 109 in the name of Colin Smith, already <laughs> debated, with Amendment 233. Colin Smith to move or not move? Yeah, not move, convener. OK. Um, do I have to call 109A? No. 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 OK. The question is... Uh, Sorry? No, I don't need to do that. We move on to the next one. No, we don't. Right, we, we, <clears throat> we have the opportunity, committee, just to move on. There is one um, amendment in this section, which, if that was debated and we went to the vote very quickly, would take us to a natural break in bus services, ending that bit and moving on to smart ticketing. There is only a small session to debate. I would propose pushing on uh, because I think. A line that you're drawing, and I think we should have the ability to concentrate on these properly. After five hours, it's, it's not a good system for making law. Um, uh, you know, if you want to. If you want to if you want to pull the plug, I'm very happy to pull it there. Therefore, I suspect now I'm going to suspend the meeting and, we and we'll take it through. We'll meet back here at six o'clock this evening uh, to continue uh, this section of amendments. I would thank the committee for their attention this morning and for the good progress that we've made.